and welcome to the conversation. I'm Heil Russell. Oh, is that my cue? That is, that is, yeah. We, no, normally, how we do <laughs> things here is I will introduce myself, and then my, hello. This my, is only my my second time <laughs> here, but this is Courtney. Quotes alter mentality unquote Swatek. Yeah, that's, me. that's your name. <laughs> that's, that's on your all your legal yeah. documents. My uh, my parents gave me the middle name quote alter mentality unquote. Yeah, it's really long. It doesn't. It always gets cut off when I try to put it on legal documents and stuff. But it works Too for you. Characters. It works for it you. It does. At yeah, least I like it. At least there's no ambiguous. Are are you junior or are you the descendant of junior or but the, you're the modern alter mentality. Like you, you don't you don't have any of that awkward lineage issues that I know of. So, uh, welcome to back to the conversation. You were last on earlier uh, in March of this year with the episode we did with Gibbon for Women's History Month. And now you are doing an episode that should have been a part of history by now, but we're just <laughs> now getting to it. This is the Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle first impressions episode. And and I know a lot of you are out there raising your hands right now because you have a question for the for the teacher here. Why? How? <laughs> it's 2022 and this game came out in 2017. The DLC that made it officially part of the DKU came out in late 2018. No, mid-2018. Uh, what the hell happened to make DK Vine, the purported expert's final say on all things Donkey Kong, what, what happened to make them drag their feet this long? And when I say they, I'm of course deflecting. I mean me, Heil... Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna get into that. I'm gonna get into that. But this is finally happening. The Mario Plus Rabbits Kingdom Battle. And I want to thank you, Courtney, for uh, putting up with the constant delays and saying, "Oh, we're gonna get to it. We're gonna get to it. We're gonna get to it." Uh, Every I, single day for <laughs> like four years, I've been checking my Twitter DMs, yeah. waiting for you to message me, and just being sad, just looking at my phone. Shaking my head, a single tear rolling down my cheek. You know, I... Every single day, Heil. <laughs> I try to make people feel things with this show. And if I can't make them feel happiness, I'm glad I can elicit some sort of emotion, even if it is sadness. So, job well done on my part. No, this episode will be about the base game. Just just your, your standard vanilla Mario plus rabbits Kingdom Battle. This episode will not really get into, we might brush up upon it, but it will not get into the Donkey Kong Adventure DLC because that is coming next time. I, I, I felt like, like long ago when, when we were first planning to do this, I was like, there's no way we can do a, an adequate first impressions and get it all into one episode because being DK Vine, being the conversation, of course, I will want to focus on all of the Donkey Kong aspects first and foremost. But I feel like we can't really get there unless we talk about the base game. So that that's why, you know, we're, we're breaking it down like this. Uh, also, this is a first impressions. Yes, I know it's several years in, but it is a first impressions. It's not a spotlight so this is going to be mostly spoiler free, which is advantageous because I know that while many of you out there have played this, including those in our live stream right now. Hello, Gibbon. Hello, Andre. Hello, Cameron. Hello, Jeff. Um, <laughs> actually, I don't know if Jeff has played it. I'm just, I'm just lumping. No, Jeff loves it. Jeff loves it. Okay. Jeff okay. loves it. I know Jeff hates the name. Jeff just went on a rant about the name this past Sunday how much he hates the name Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. And we went, we had a discussion during our Sea of Thieves stream about why it, it's, it's broken down like that. And quite honestly, I still don't know. But um, yeah, I, I know a lot of you out there have played it, but I also know 
because I know how people's mind works, that a lot of people probably slept on this one. Especially Donkey Kong fans who may not pick up every DK appearance outside of the core franchise. And, like, uh, I ran into that with, you know, Skylanders Superchargers. I was like, hey, who wants to talk about Skylanders? And so it was like, everyone's like, hi, it's Skylanders. I don't give a shit. I'm like, but look how well Donkey Kong is animated. And Diddy's in a little sidecar, isn't it? It's like, we don't care. And of course, this is kind of more higher profile than even uh, Superchargers was. But, you know, some people don't really care unless it's not a proper Donkey Kong game. And, uh, you know, it, this episode's in particular is going to be a bit odd for me, uh, Mr. DK Vine, because it's a game that's not DKU. Except for the add-on DLC, which retroactively makes the whole package DKU. But on this episode, we're talking about that base game, which wouldn't be DKU without the DLC. And not even bringing up the DLC, which is contradictory to every base instinct I have. So, (laughs) I'm going to have to lean on you to help me through this uncharted territory. I'm scared. Quite I'll frankly, do my best. quite frankly, I don't like. I'm not going to be able to just say Donkey Kong every 30 seconds as kind of you know a, a soothing, calming aid to help quell my anxiety. So I'm going to have to talk about Mario. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I feel like it's necessary to get through the base game first impressions before we get to the uh the donkey kong adventure think of it as you know you have to eat your dinner before you get your dessert how can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat how can you have your banana pudding if you don't eat that tasty tasty mario meat (laughs) right i love banana pudding especially with the vanilla wafers in it that's like my oh yeah it's my Mm. favorite dessert and like after a while i just stopped i just started telling my mom hey mom i don't want birthday cake you just give me that banana pudding with the wafers in it. I can't say I like Mario meat, though. Uh, I, I As a vegetarian... Well, you just gotta give it a try, you know? As a vegetarian who's almost fully vegan now, I, I, I just, yeah, I... Like, if there was a vegan Mario alternative, like some sort of, like, soy-based mario meats, i would i would eat that up i would try it but also italian food doesn't agree with me by and large like the just too acidic for my uh delicate yeah. system so i mean mario's taken many forms there is paper mario so maybe there could be like a vegan mario like a the impossible mario i thought you were just gonna tell me to eat paper <laughs> i was like i'm not that kid in the back <laughs> of the class eating paper uh Really quick, before we get into it, I do want to remind everyone that DK Vine is on Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash DK Vine. Once again, I just want to thank all of our lovely, lovely patrons. Because without their humble offerings on my altar, DK Vine would not exist at all. Wouldn't be able to afford it. Uh, it, it would be beyond me, and uh, it keeps the lights on, it, it allows us, uh, you know, to purchase these games and talk about them, and, you know, times be tough, but the the fact that you all believe in the dream of Donkey Kong journalism fills my heart with joy, so thank you, thank you all. And would you like to share what's happening in the world of Alter Mentality? Sure. So uh, I kind of didn't stream too much for a while because I got a new job over the past few months. But things are picking up again. So um, I stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Alter Mentality. I actually, uh, to prepare for this episode, I played the entire base game again over the past couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Um I actually kind of had to rush through it, which was unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I was still able to get through the whole game, but I didn't do any of the little side challenges or anything like that. Um, but it was a really good time. It was, like, super nice to revisit this game. I really probably didn't have to, just to talk about it in general terms, but I'm glad I did. Um, so I stream pretty much whatever I feel like, but what I feel like often has to do with, you know, the rare fandom in general, Donkey yeah. Kong, because those are my favorite things, so... Um, Famously, every year I play Grabbed by the Coolies around Halloween, and I play Donkey Kong 64 101% in one sitting 
sometime oh. in early December. Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time. I, not 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 to the grab by the ghoulies. It, it was the one sitting 101 percent of Donkey Kong 64 that hurt me on the insides. Yeah, it's it's fun though. I I honestly am already looking forward to it. You know, it's like five months away, but yeah. It, um, and then oh, go on. No, I was just gonna say I'm I'm hoping it gets added to Nintendo with Switch Online Plus expansion pack soon. So you mm-hmm. know, I I can play it with properly with the N sixty four controller and avoid the whole awful mess that was playing it on the Wii U. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am lucky enough to still have a functioning Jungle Green N64, which I got with the DK64 bundle back oh, in nice. the day. So that's the only way that I will ever play it as long as it keeps working. You got to, you know, have the full synergy of the translucent green console and controller and the yellow game pack and everything and the expansion pack. Can't forget Right. I never got um, that. I feel like a bad fan, oh. but I already had an N64 and I was like, I don't need a second N64 that's called Jungle Green, but it's more translucent than anything. Like it, it whatever, but I, I didn't need it. So <laughs> I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get it. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that is the, I didn't have an N64. That was the one that my parents got for me back in the day um, because I just didn't get an N64 until DK64 came out and you know, being the DK fan that I already was, that's just what they chose to get me. Um, so it just kind of worked out. Mm. But, okay, so besides that, <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's just a couple other things that I want to mention. So I have a webcomic that I think Rare fans might enjoy. It's called, well, it's it's kind of a spinoff of my older webcomic, which has been on hiatus forever, but this one is called Air of Silver Skull. It's uh, heavily inspired by DKC2 in particular. It's about pirates and uh it's just very i don't know i i like to think that the the style seeps in so if you like uh you know animal people well the main character is like a pirate salamander guy and i think that you know if you like cartoony characters that are also taken seriously you'll enjoy it you can check it out at the fourth comic.com and then the other thing that i wanted to shout out is that uh if you go to the DK Vine Forum, um, you can find a thread, I think it's in general DKU discussion, um, called A Donkey Kong's World, and that is the D&D campaign that I did with a lot of other conversation regulars um, over the past year. It just wrapped up recently, and I wrote up all the summaries for it um, and did some illustrations. So if you want to read like a very long but very good like communal DKU fanfic, if that sounds like your type of thing... You should check it out, because I think it's great. And uh, Mitchell was our DM, and he did a fantastic job bringing it all together, so. I I have a question. Yeah? Does D&D stand for Donkey and Diddy? What what does that mean? (laughs) It it should, but in this case, it stands for Dungeons and Dragons. No, I'm I'm joking. I'm not that, I'm not that ignorant. (laughs) I just, I, 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 I play it up. I play it up, because somebody has to be. The Donkey Kong Zealot, right? And 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 I I just I I play I mean, it up. We have, sometimes yeah, we have to be clear about it. It, yeah. it could stand for you know Dungeons and Diddy, which is <laughs> maybe an interesting spinoff that Diddy could have sometime in the future, or Donkey and Dragons, which is just Shrek. Which I know you wouldn't really know anything about that, but the hell is Shrek? <laughs> I was gonna say Donkey and Dragons. Well. You know, there were, there were the space dragons from Jungle Beat, and then of course, you know, Diddy met Smokey the Dragon, and then oh, but yeah, yeah, it was right. Yeah, okay. oh well, yeah. So check all of that out, uh, and just don't do it while you're listening to this, because we require your full, undivided attention as we finally discuss Mario plus Rabbids. Should be equals Kingdom Battle because you think that's going to be like a mathematical thing, Mario plus Rabbids. But no, it's just Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. And there's not even a, uh, a colon in that name, which is weird. Like, because, you know, I, I'm one who fights the colon in Tropical Freeze. I think it should just be Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze to be stylistically accurate with the rest of the series. Because it's not Donkey Kong Country 5 Tropical Freeze. 
It's Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, a la Donkey Country Returns. I realize that's ugly to most people's eyes. It's like a Star Trek in a darkness thing, which people hated. But <laughs> I think if anything should have a colon, it should be Mario plus Rabbids colon Kingdom Battle, especially since we're getting a second one, Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. But there's not a colon in that one either. And I'm like, what? Why? Why no colon? And also, why the plus? Why isn't it an ampersand or at least a an X? Like you know, like the cro- like the crossover thing you see so much these days why isn't it that why why is it mario plus rabbits i don't know it's weird i don't do you have any yeah, insight it's a, it's on a this? bit unwieldy um i it is an unwieldy title i've gotten used to it over the years and um i think people who would talk about this game more often which i am friends with a few speedrunners of it but they normally just call it mrkb it's a nice little acronym mrkb and uh I, I, for a long time, even though I love this game, I, I kept accidentally calling it Mario versus Rabbids. Yeah, um, yeah. E- even though he, <laughs> you know, teams up with some of the Rabbids, so it's not just this wholly antagonistic, uh, you know, uh, relationship mm-hmm. with these these characters from another series. But it's fine. It, it is what it is. Like it's it just one of those things where that's a weird name, and it took me a long time to get a handle on it until now you know i know i have it committed to memory mario plus rabbits kingdom battle but yeah it, it gets really more complicated when we add donkey kong adventure and, and we have to like discuss oh it's mario plus rabbits kingdom battle donkey kong adventure which uh, of course i have in the mario plus rabbits kingdom battle uh gold what is it? gold edition yeah i've got it right here let me let me get it in my hand here because this is essential to understanding why it took us so long or why it took me let me let me put the blame where it belongs why it took me so long to finally do this so i admit that this episode is not just long overdue it's past the expiration date it should have happened years ago Now, the problem was, and this is just to the best of my recollection, because, again, a lot has happened in the intervening years. There was a pandemic. I don't know if you knew that. But the problem was there was a very odd disparity between the different regions getting a physical edition with the Donkey Kong Adventure DLC I'll say bundled with it, but, it, you know, even when it's bundled in it, it's just this little sheet that has the, the download code on it. So, you know, it, it's not like it, it comes installed on with the game disc. It's the same game disc. It just comes with a little sheet that says, hey, you have the Donkey Kong Adventure DLC. But uh, they, they also changed the packaging to reflect that it's the gold edition with all of the content, including a new story with Donkey Kong. And Europe got this announced, I think, before DK Adventure even dropped in June of 2018. So because of that, because we saw it was coming out in Europe, uh, you know, Ubisoft's home territory, I guess. Ubisoft Milan is, is the studio behind this. But the expectation was that we in the Americas would get it as well. And while I briefly toyed with getting the game and just downloading the DLC via via the eShop, I was a late adapter to it, obviously, because I didn't get Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle when it came out. So I figured the most hardcore DKU fanatic method would be to get the physical copy with Donkey Kong on the cover. That's what I had to do, right? All right, well, the problem is, and I, I realize as I unspool this for everyone, I sound like a mad person. I sound like I, I you know, belong in an institution. But the problem is that, <laughs> well, the physical gold edition just never came out in the Americas, or at least it felt like that for a long time. Donkey Kong Adventure launched on June 26, 2018. So by the time we hit November, it felt like, Okay, you know, we're we're in the holiday shopping season. Maybe the Americas are just never going to get it. And then I considered buying Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle 
au naturel, you know, I just just get the get the standard game case and just download Donkey Kong Adventure. But if I was going to go that route, I needed to get the best version, the most expensive, ludicrous version of it. And the game had released more than a year earlier in August of 2017, I believe. And so by that point, the collector's edition with the figurine of, of Mario, uh, of Rabbit Mario, of the soundtrack and the collector's cards was relatively scarce, at least in stores. Now, given that I just revealed recently that I paid 170 US dollars for the physical Killer Instinct 2013 Collector's Edition, you know, I'm more than willing to go the secondhand market if I had to and pay in, you know, absurd sums of money to to get it. But you know, I didn't feel like I was quite up against that wall yet where that would be necessary because there was still a little part in the back of my brain that said, maybe the Americas will get the physical gold edition with Donkey Kong on the cover. Oh, and you might be wondering, well, Heil, why didn't you just import the European version? You could have just played that on your Switch. It's not region locked. And, and well, yes, that is true. I could have done that, but my OCD wouldn't allow it. I, I, I seriously struggled with this. Because I have the American version for all of my physical DKU games. Even the ones that were barely released in the Americas. Like, you know, It's Mr. Pants. So, push come the shove. If a DKU game only released in Europe, then sure, sure, I would import it. If that was the case. But I kept holding on to hope that the physical gold edition with Donkey Kong on the cover would come to our neck of the woods. And if not our neck, then maybe, you know, our lower abdomen or, or maybe our knees or, or wiggly toes. But finally, Courtney, finally in March mm-hmm. of 2019, it surfaced on this continent as a Costco exclusive. Now, let me explain Costco really quick to those of you who aren't familiar <laughs> So, Costco combines all the excess of late-stage retail capitalism with the exclusivity of a country club membership. Now, they pay their workers really well, and they're one of the more uh, forward-thinking progressive retailers in the market. So, I shouldn't be slamming them, but it is like the, the cost of entry. You have to pay for a membership to even get through the doors, or you could go, I think, as a guest with somebody. Anyway, you know, I, I, my mom was a Costco member back in the day and, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed going in there and smelling the tires because they, they had like the tire center and I'm somebody who enjoys. Oh this. gosh. I enjoy the smell of tires. Okay. I, good. I do too. Good. Good. I'm glad. Also Costco rules. My, uh, partner is a Costco member and I go with him and technically I'm not a member, but I get to go in Yeah. because I'm with him and, you know. It's we we buy a lot of stuff in bulk there, and we bought at the beginning of the pandemic twenty pounds of spaghetti that we still have not worked through. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't actually have an issue with Costco. It's just in this one circumstance, Costco is probably the last place I would want the gold physical edition of Mario Plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle with Donkey Kong on the cover to surface because yeah, I'm not a Costco it's a member. Weird. I'm not a Costco member, and I, and so I like had to consider: Am I going to pay for a Costco membership? just to get this now fortunately my mother-in-law was a costco member and it allowed me to use her membership illegally to access their website store order my fucking donkey kong game and have it shipped to me and and believe me it was awkward going to her and explaining this because I just had to go through the, the whole preamble I just gave the conversation audience. I'm used to being the buffoon on my podcast. It's a bit odder to go to your extended family and being like, um, there's a Donkey Kong game that I really want, but Costco has the version with Donkey Kong on the cover, and that's the version I need. And can I take your membership card, please? <sighs> anyway, that's the story of how I got the physical gold edition, which... The, the, the American version of it doesn't actually have Donkey Kong on the front of the game case. Uh, it does have his name on the bottom. It says, includes a new story with Donkey Kong. It's got the Donkey Kong logo on it. And uh, Donkey Kong does appear on the back. It's got the little render of him about to like, fling the giant banana. So he's on there, really tiny, but he's on there. 
and uh, this is the most DKU edition of Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle I could get, and I have the very rare Costco exclusive American Physical Gold Edition. And, and so, anyway, <laughs> long story short, at this point, you know, <laughs> I don't think any part of that story was short. Uh, I could have gone longer. Uh, I, I could have. <laughs> there, there was this really awkward like week where I was really afraid that they were going to sell out of the gold edition with Donkey Kong on the cover, uh, or I guess in this case, Donkey Kong on the back cover, you know, because Costco, they sometimes get limited supplies of things. And once they sell out, it's gone. And so I was sweating this because you don't even see this on the secondhand market, this edition. Uh, I, I had to give away Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle Gold Edition as a Twitter prize recently on one of our Twitter giveaways. And I, I was like, well, let me see if I can find the Costco edition. Can't find it. Can't find it. You, you can get the European edition. So I like reached out to them. It's like, hey, would you be cool with this one with the Peggy rating on it? And they were like, yeah, I'm not a freak like you. And I was like, cool. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so anyway, by this point, it's like mid 2019. And then, you know, Banjo Kazooie gets into Smash and a whole lot of other stuff happens. And I, I, feel like we missed the moment i felt like there was no natural place to step in and say and here's your mario plus rabbit's kingdom battle first impressions <sighs> so three more years happened and anyway they've announced a release date for mario plus rabbit's sparks of hope it's coming out this october and i felt like hey there's an opportunity. <laughs> we we got to do this before the sequel comes out. So, hey, do you remember Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle? Well, here's two conversation episodes about our first impressions. Yay. You want to hear my story yeah. about the game? Yeah. Okay, so when the game came out, I bought it. And uh, when the DLC came out, I downloaded it. How does it That's feel to not have all of these <laughs> mental hang-ups that keep you from enjoying life? Oh, I have them just in other places. <laughs> no, no, don't get me wrong. I, you know, self-deprecate. I, I, I'm hard on myself. I, I actually do like myself unless I'm having a severe depressive moment and then, you know, I have all of the demons spring up. But I am ecstatic. I have the version I needed, the version I wanted, the correct version for my collection. I'm ecstatic. I wouldn't go back and change things any other way. Maybe I would have done this sooner. <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, I'm fine with how things worked out. I am drinking right now, though, just in case any of that doubt springs up. I am drinking a special blend of cider in honor of Grant Kirkhope. I, I tried to get the most Grant Kirk. Hopian cider I, I could find, and I found one put out by uh, my my brand, Bold Rock. Uh, they they put out a watermelon cider hybrid, and I don't like watermelon flavored things. I don't really like watermelon, to be honest. But because Grant Kirkhope composed a Donkey Kong game where watermelons were the the health, I thought, well. There we go. I will drink this during the Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle first impressions. And let me just say, it's awful. <laughs> mm. I probably like it. I like I like fruity beers. I like watermelon. Yeah. What's cider? I like pretty much all yeah, kinds but, of cider. All right. Th this is like watermelon barely has a taste. And when you combine that with apple, it just tastes like apple, but something's wrong with the apple. Yeah, just like super sweet apple, I would imagine. Yeah, it's it's like something oozed into the apple and you're not sure what, if, if it's just like a really sweet like insect or, or something. But it, yeah, no, no, thank you. I won't be making this mistake again. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> now, okay. Let me be shamefully honest here and, and let you know why this also took so long. And then we're going to stop explaining ourselves and we're just going to get into it. The biggest hurdle I had after I actually got the game in my hands was getting into the game. I've actually, now I've, I've talked about this with our friend, the geek critique, Josh Wallen, or as, as it says on his legal documents, Josh, quote, the geek critique, end quote, Wallen. 
uh, he's had a similar problem as I have, and that's turn-based tactical games just aren't my forte. They're not. I, you know, the, the only other experience I've had with the genre is the GBA Fire Emblem, the first one, uh, the, the one that came out in outside of Japan first. Um, I played that to completion. Uh, I, I think if you don't live in Japan, it was just called Fire Emblem, but now they've retroactively given it a subtitle, the Burning Bed, Burning Sword, something, something. Uh, but anyway, I, I played all of that game to completion, and I played it at a time when DK Vine had to answer the question once and for all whether characters who who debut in cameo games would actually count as native DKU characters, and since Super Smash Brothers. Melee was the Western debut of the character of Roy, who appears in Fire Emblem GBA as a little kid. I, I, I had to play it just to be sure, and then that helped me realize that, hey, this game has zero to do with the DKU. The Waluigi rule is absolutely an important amendment to the DKU rules, and to just let it go. And so, uh, that being said, I actually did enjoy Fire Emblem, but... I had to really try to get into it because I, you know, there, there's a steep learning curve, not really learning though, as much as just getting on the same wavelength as the game. What eventually got me on board with that Fire Emblem game is I think the idea of building up your team and leveling them up and, you know, this is what helped me get into Kingdom Battle eventually, was building a team, customizing the weaponry and skills and all of those, you know, branches and trees. And I enjoy that even if turn-based tactical fighting was, you know, a, a hurdle, I eventually found ways to make it enjoyable for me. And once I did, I was able to really get into this game. But, like, looking back at it, just the, the whole turn-based thing was really what kept me from getting into the original Super Mario RPG, if I'm honest with myself. Because I never played an RPG before Super Mario RPG, and of course I rented it because it was a new Super Mario game. I was like, I want to I wanna try this out. And I put it in my Super Nintendo, turned it on, and I thought, what? have I gotten myself into <laughs> you like you have to let the enemy attack you you have no choice <laughs> yeah like the, what's Mario's problem he's just standing around while the enemy attacks him what's what's wrong what's right, going this on is, here this isn't what Mario does yeah <laughs> Mario just jumps on the turtles and then he keeps running like he doesn't just stand there and take it this is insane <laughs> so as, as far as kingdom battle goes I would pick this game up I would try it out for a bit. I would put it down. A couple of weeks would pass. I would try it again, and I would put it down. And this continued throughout most of 2019 into 2020, and then a little into 2021. I finally really hit my stride with it in the last year, though. And actually, you know, I finally got a handle on, on all that. That's what I told Josh when he was complaining about this. I was like, you really got to get, I think, deep into the first world for the game to really start clicking for you. Because if this, if this isn't your type of game, it's going to be a pretty steep uphill climb to get into it. And that's not uh, an indictment against this game. It's just, if you're a platformer person coming into a tactical turn-based game... It's a completely different world. Yeah. I mean, so like most platformers, I mean, obviously in stuff like Banjo-Kazooie and DK64, you learn moves as you go. But I mean, in most platformers, you get the gist of it like immediately and right. it never really changes the fundamentals. But um, the thing about a lot of RPGs or tactical games is that like you have to play for like hours before you start really like getting into the meat of the gameplay and all the different options that you have. And that's where it starts like really clicking and being fun so it, it can be a, a big ask to like you know just hey you just gotta play it for like several hours before you start really enjoying it but i mean that's just how it is <laughs> right and i mentioned super mario rpg and that's a game i actually have a bit of nostalgia for in the end but 
I've never played it through all the way because I, 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 I never owned it. I rented it a couple times and it, you know, I, I tried to like it. <laughs> I like the presentation of it, but I just never got into it. But I know you have a deeper history with Super Mario RPG, which actually informs your own opinions on Kingdom Battle. Mm-hmm. So have you ever played any other Mario RPGs besides Sesame RPG? Does Kingdom Battle count? Uh, yes, I, I would count it, but sure. uh, I then guess yes, that I, answer... I <laughs> played Kingdom like Battle, answer. yes. All right, all right. Okay, so I have prepared a little um, educational presentation for you about okay. the history of the Mario RPGs. Th- this is good um, because everybody's always telling me, Heil, you know, th- you always describe what you like in video games. You would really like the Mario RPGs. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, don't tell me what to play. <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, I don't know if you would like the gameplay that much based on mm-hmm. what you've said so far. But, yeah. uh, I mean, the reason I became a Mario RPG fan, uh, I'd say around middle school or so, is that when I started getting into them. I, I think it was like a, just a really natural follow-on from already being a Rare fan. A lot of the appeal is the same. Um, but I'll get into that a little bit later. I just wanted to give a little history lesson first because, um, like, obviously Kingdom Battle isn't an RPG per se. It's more of, like, a strategy game, but it has a lot of the same, like, core identity and a lot of the same questions that it's, like, how do you translate the, like, action-packed, dynamic platforming gameplay of the Mario series into a turn-based game? And why would you even want to do that? And, like... You know, what are what are the advantages of, like, exploring genres like this with the Mario characters? So, uh, let's just uh, get into it a little bit. So, sure. Super Mario RPG, you uh, did play this, you said. You, you know, rented it. Um, this came out in 1996, and actually, an interesting thing is that it didn't come out in Europe or Australia. It only came out in Japan and North America. Um, so, Europe didn't get it until the Wii Virtual Console, um... So, so that was kind of weird. It was just like this kind of... I've, I've talked to people I know that like grew up in... I mean, they're Europe, European or Australian. And it's like SMRPG was like this weird mythical thing that they heard about, but they didn't have any access to it yeah, um, that, for a long time. Honestly irritates me that it didn't come out worldwide. Like that... 1996 is pretty late, in my opinion, to withhold a Mario game from several major markets. Like, like, okay, maybe the mid to late 80s when you would always hear these stories about all these Mario games that Japan had that never made it out, you know, and like, mm-hmm. th- that that's one thing. But by 1996, like, come on, like, that's right before the N64 came out. Yeah, and so I have like, I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of answer out there that's been addressed at some point, but I don't know why it wasn't brought to the other markets. Uh, maybe because it was so late in this Ness's life cycle, they were just like, Let's just not even bother because the N64 is here. Um, but I don't know. Uh, so this was made by Square, you know, the yeah. makers of Final Fantasy and all that. So um, this game has maintained like a really steady, uh, like sort of cult classic popularity. Um, it it sort of stands alone. It's it's this kind of weird looking back on it. It, it seems like this kind of weird take on the Mushroom Kingdom. But, uh, you know, I was talking with some other people about this recently and like, uh, before the Mario brand had standardized so much, like it was constantly evolving and changing and sort of reinventing itself back in like the Super Nintendo era. Yeah. So it didn't really seem that weird at the time. Like, you know, you had these kind of weird alien bad guys that are all based on weapons that come in and invade the Mushroom Kingdom. But like, it seems weird now. But back then, it was just like, sure, this is, you know, we've had Bowser, but we've also had like Wart. And, you know, this is just the next... To Tonga, bunch of weirdos. yeah, yeah, exactly, and and, and yeah, like th- this was right before, in my opinion, and I know some may disagree with the timeline here, but I feel like this is the last gasp of the Mario series being able to be anything it really wanted to be, because I feel like Super Mario sixty four sort of came out and bluntly made the idea of at least the mainline Mario games, but as a trickle-down effect, many of the spin-offs made it as sterile as a hospital hallway. It just kind of sanitized everything, and it, well, left, it left less room for 
wild ideas, which Super Mario RPG had in abundance. For sure, but I as I will explain, that actually held on longer than you might think, but it definitely, you know... Mm-hmm. But what you were talking about did happen for sure, but um, it was it was a bit later. Um, so so the thing about SMRPG is uh, it was like really influential, clearly not only to its players but like people who would go on to make the other Mario RPGs. Um, it introduced a lot of things that were new at the time, such as uh, it wasn't the first time Peach was playable in a game, but like Peach being a force to be reckoned with, um, and also she's a healer, which is something that comes back into Kingdom Battle as well. Um, mm. playable Bowser, which is not in Kingdom Battle, but will be in the sequel, Sparks of Hope. Um, and then just a whole bunch of other things that were carried onward into the future Mario RPGs. Um, and its composer, uh, was Yoko Shimomura, one of my favorite game composers. And if that name is familiar, it is because she is joining Grant Kirkhope and Gareth Coker in the sequel to Mario Plus Rabbids. And I am like super, super hyped about it. Like... It's so exciting. She is she is an amazing composer. She um, has done, in addition to Mario games here and there, she's done like Kingdom Hearts and she did Street Fighter 2. At least, I don't know if she did the whole soundtrack, but at least like the iconic Guile's theme and, and stuff like that. So just fantastic. Um, so yeah, that's some RPG. That's enough well, about that for now. Well, uh-huh. I, I, I would also add that the thing that sticks out for me about Super Mario RPG was it did try to go for, if, if not a one-to-one aping of, it, it was definitely of the same vintage of the Donkey Kong Country style pre-rendered graphics. Oh, Yeah. In um, fact, yeah, I forgot to say this, but there are actually some DKC references in the game. Oh yes, uh, there is. There is even there's like some characters that look exactly like Donkey Kong that are enemies. Yes, yeah, so there um, there is uh, Chained Kong and Gorilla G U E R I L L A, and of course I saw Chained Kong in a screenshot in Nintendo Power before the game came out, and I was like, oh my god, is Donkey Kong in this? Is Donkey Kong in this? And I briefly considered, is Super Mario RPG, I didn't even call it the DKU at the time, but I was like, is this going to have an appearance of the Donkey Kong Country Donkey Kong in it? Do I need to buy it? Is this going to be the fourth game in the DKU? Uh, and and then I eventually you know, saw in a later screenshot, they identified it as Chain Kong, and I was like, oh, it's not him. Good. I can ignore it. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of Donkey Kong Country vibes in it. I like the the bee. There's bee enemies in yeah, it. Yeah, there's that look- bees that look a lot like zingers, and there's yeah. even just some of the environments are very like jungly, and they've got the same sort of feel of the like trees and stuff. Plasticky trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it kind of looks like what's what's the Sonic game that also came out around this time that looked had that pre rendered look. Uh, um, I don't know. I'm sure someone can answer that. Josh like, would be Sonic able to answer, expert. but he's not here. But yeah, but it it, it reminds, especially the isometric kind of view, reminds me of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it it felt very much of this Sonic era. 3D Blast. Sonic apparently. 3D Blast. Okay. Um, but yeah, this like 1994 to right up to the release of the N64, this was the look of hit games and i mm-hmm. i appreciate that that mario got touched by it because you see those acm renders of mario you see him at the end of dunk on country 2 but you see you know they, they pose him with diddy and a couple of promotional shots and he's hugging tj combo's leg while tj combo's holding diddy up by his tail and my favorite one i just shared on twitter the other day but you know, you you would see this this rendition of Mario before he gets standardized. I think with Super Mario sixty four, roughly, and you know Mario kind of took on this more like svelte look. He was like mm-hmm. they, they thinned him down a little bit and made him more acrobatic and but the, the sexy new Mario, right? Like the the Mario that makes you thirsty and <laughs> but this this is like Super Mario RPG was classic pudgy stocky mario you know the the mario i grew Mm -hmm. up with the mario when i was a mario fan a self-identified mario fan this was the mario i knew before he became you know uh, a trapeze artist 
Okay, so uh, I actually didn't play SMRPG until I had a Wii, and I played it on the Virtual Console. Um, but my intro to the Mario RPGs was Paper Mario on the N64. So uh, now here's an interesting little way to tie things back together. Paper Mario, the series, is made by um, Intelligent Systems, who make Fire Emblem. A, a little obscure series called Fire Emblem that you may have heard of. Um yeah, and, I, I, yeah. I, I've at least heard of one of those, the, the only one I've played, but... But, uh, so, here's the thing about Paper Mario, it is, I, you know, you probably aren't really tuned into the Mario drama, considering you didn't know that people were mad about Daisy not being in, uh, Strikers, whatever. Okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, I, I am tuned in enough to know what my, uh, my fellow DK Vine staffers talk about, so occasionally mm -hmm. I get some th via osmosis, so... I know a little bit about the drama of Paper Mario, but I'm not exactly 100% educated, so I, I could use the explanation. Right. So the thing about Paper Mario is uh, there have been six games now, and basically the series has completely changed its identity, and really the only thing it has in common with where it started out is the art style. Um you know, it, it's maintained this, like, 2D on 3D, really cute, appealing look the whole time. Um, but the first game came out in 2001 on the N64. Uh, and so what makes Paper Mario really unique among RPGs is, you know, a lot of RPGs, you play them and then, like, you just are getting more and more powerful throughout. And then by the end, you're doing, like, a thousand points of damage to the boss who has, like, 60,000 HP or something. But Paper Mario is unique because it's like a low numbers RPG. So like you start out just doing like one or two damage to your enemies. And then by the end of the game, like maybe with this single attack, you're doing like six or something. Uh -huh. And it manages to stay like engaging and have like a difficulty curve that ramps up while keeping things so simple this whole time. And uh, people, I think, find that really appealing because um, it, it like keeps things deceptively simple. Like um, there's a lot of customization and a lot of different ways you can approach different battles while still having it never get like too like just a, a huge just blitz of numbers coming at you or anything um there's a lot of like customization in the battles because there's these things things called badges where you can equip them and it'll like you know change the properties of your different attacks and stuff um and then you have partners so mario teams up with a variety of different like mario species like he's got a goomba friend he's got a koopa friend and so on and like they each have their different abilities they can do in the overworld as well as in battle. Um, so Paper Mario was called that because it has like this storybook visual style where it's like, you know, these flat characters moving around on this 3D world. But in Japan, it was actually just called Mario Story because the paper element doesn't really have anything to do with like the actual story or like, you know, it's just a visual style thing, you know? What, wasn't originally... It'd be like calling Wind Waker like Toon Zelda or something. Wasn't originally it going to be called Super Mario RPG 2, even? Yes, I believe so. And it does have a lot of, like, plot elements sort of in common. There's, there's, there's like, certain things in common with SMRPG, but it's it's more of, like, a, I guess, not it's not, like, a direct sequel or anything. It's just kind of, like, a the same spirit type of thing. Um, in both, you're getting, like, these stars that are the MacGuffins, essentially, and um, there's some unique things that they maintain, like, these little wizard characters that are kind of important in both games that were just kind of introduced for the RPGs. Um, but it's it's pretty much a distinct thing. Uh -huh. Okay, so then we got Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, which came out on the GameCube in 2004. And um, so this one is, it plays similarly to the first Paper Mario, but it's just kind of it's got a lot of just general improvements across the board um, it, to its, like, complexity and stuff. Um, and it, this game is, like, really good, and it's so good that, like, people have become annoyed with everyone who says it's good because its fans can be a little annoying, I guess. But, like, I don't know. There, there's, like, it's one of those things that's, like, so popular because it is good that people try to say that it's not good because they just... I don't know. It's it's like people saying Ocarina of Time was actually bad for some reason or another or whatever. No, tr um, trust me. As a Grab by the Ghoulies fan, I get this <laughs> all the time. I know. It's like I can't even talk about Grab by the Ghoulies anymore without people being like, oh, shut up about Grab by the Ghoulies. We get it. I know. But uh, 
that's just you know you just got to keep carrying that flag for what you love just don't don't ever give up no even if what it's so say. mainstream i know i know yeah my, my opinions are so vanilla i'm just <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so so ttyd is generally considered to be like the peak of the series um and then you get to Super Paper Mario, which is my favorite Mario game ever, uh, which makes me a freak. Um, <laughs> this came out on the Wii in 2007, and at the time it was kind of like a weird... Well, it seemed like it was kind of going to be a weird spinoff, because, uh, you know all that great RPG gameplay I was just telling you about? Mm-hmm. Well, SPM just, like, is something totally different. It is like a puzzle platformer. Um, with very light RPG elements. So you, you level up and your like basic jump attacks and stuff do more damage as you go on throughout the game. But mostly it's like a puzzle platformer. Um, and you get to play as uh, Mario, Peach, Luigi, and Bowser. And uh, this game was like very divisive at the time because it was so different and it remains divisive today. Um, what it maintains from the first two games is a story that is surprisingly like emotional and um this escalates it more than ever before uh it it is like just a a completely melodramatic story about love and romance and all kinds of stuff and i love it it's it's like uh some people think it's a bit much but but i love it um the characters in this game are just like some of my favorite characters in games ever um but yeah, some people think that this game really doesn't even feel like a Mario game anymore because it's about like Mario and friends going to all these different weird dimensions and the art style is really weird and like geometric and stuff. And a lot of the characters are just completely original weirdos that aren't even like Koopas or Toads or anything like that. Um, but I think it's great. So that's it's, It sounds refreshing from where things eventually go. Yeah, so so like you were saying that you felt that the Mario series in the N64 was already starting to get clamped down and like, you know, a couldn't little be creative bit. Like, anymore. Like, uh, uh, there, there are degrees to which it got, like, you, you would still get some original thought here and there. Like, I, I look at the first Mario Party game and, and I compare that to the more recent entries and you just look at what they were allowed to do as far as establishing things in Mario's world versus how they have to rein that back in. And like, mm-hmm. oh, we can't have these original characters. We just need to have a, a generic Toad and a generic Shy Guy. And, you know, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think Super Mario 64 was the beginning of that kind of uh, blandification. Uh, but obviously it took... a uh, maybe even a couple decades before it to really uh, take effect and, and become a problem. Yeah, so that creativity definitely held on in the spinoffs, at least the RPGs, for quite a while. Uh, but so, like I said, Super Paper Mario was this totally weird, just bonkers game that just happens to feature Mario, basically, but is just mm-hmm. doing whatever it wants. And then Nintendo said... That is enough of that, thank you. And um, they made a game on the 3DS in 2012 called Paper Mario Sticker Star. Now, (laughs) regardless... I'm I'm, I'm uh laughing because I just uh, remember hearing all the vitriol. (laughs) Oh boy. I... Oh man. Okay, so... Like I said, SPM was pretty divisive, but regardless of how the Paper Mario fan base felt about that one, pretty much everybody hated Sticker Star. Now, disclaimer, it does have its fans. There's there's dozens of them. Um, there's, there's Sticker Star fans out there. I know some of them. Uh, but so basically, not only did they like not really return to the original gameplay, but they basically stripped out everything that people found appealing about this series. So the dialogue was, like, greatly reduced. Like, Bowser is in it, but he doesn't say a word. I don't think Peach says a word either. Um, And then, like, the story was very, like, rudimentary as a Mario story. Um, All the Toads, they weren't allowed to have, like, hair and mustaches anymore. They all just have to be, like, the most generic-looking, like, male-coded Toads. Um... No, right. no girl toads anymore, except for Toadette. 
Yeah, um, I, I feel like yeah. that that was the consequence of the new Super Mario Brothers series being mm-hmm. as successful as it was. It it like it was this poison pill. Maybe that's where you, the blame really lies, and not Super Mario sixty four. I don't know. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, but so so basically, like this, you could consider it maybe like a reboot of the series where they were like. Uh, all of that fun stuff that people really love, well, we're just not going to do that anymore. And so uh, another thing that they brought in was the like paper element of the game actually being really important. So the uh-huh. fact that Mario is actually a paper being that exists in this paper craft world is something that is acknowledged constantly, uh, both as part of the plot and the fact that they make like every paper related joke or pun you can imagine like constantly like Oh. Just so they, much. Because, and I might be wrong here because I'm not somebody who's played a Paper Mario game, but before this, you could make the argument that it's the same Mario, that it, 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 it's just artistically yes. portrayed uh, as such. Right. So, yeah. like, in TTYD, for instance, Mario does some things like folding into a paper airplane or, like, a paper boat and stuff. So there's, like, this kind of weird middle ground there but Mm -hmm. it's not really an important thing so like the the paper thing is just kind of like a fun little visual like haha thing but it it was never like said that they were in some different dimension where they're aware of being flat paper people or anything to make this relatable to the dku fans if there's like any clones of me out there who have never played a Paper Mario game and need a DKU reference point to help you. It, it's like Mr. Pants. Mr. Pants in the universe of the DKU, he's not actually a stick figure man. That's just the way he's artistically portrayed. Uh, he's just a regular dude uh, in the context of the DKU. He's, th- Except not- for our D&D campaign where he is actually a stick figure man who is also a god. Okay, so. well, well, but <laughs> that that being said, you know, I, I, I think it's pretty comparable to uh, paper the, the early games of the Paper Mario mm-hmm. series. Sure. Okay, so, like, we've gone on the Paper Mario thing long enough, so, so basically they came out with another game on the Wii U in 2016 called Color Splash, and because it was on the Wii U, I think a lot of people didn't actually play it. It's one of the few games that's stuck on the Wii U and probably is never going to be ported to the Switch. Um, a lot of people just think it's probably like Sticker Star 2.0, but I think that's a little unfair because I think uh, Color Splash actually has some really like clever writing and scenarios and stuff in it, but it still has all the same things where all the characters have to be as generic as possible. And, you know, it's paper people dealing with paper problems you know uh i think it's a good game in its own way but i can definitely see why people wouldn't even want to give it a chance um and that brings us to where the fandom was at the time of mario plus rabbids's release because you know basically people who loved the paper mario series that had the rug pulled out from under them and what they liked wasn't really there anymore so there was just this general sense of disappointment and disillusion and being pissed off at Nintendo, basically. And uh, the the postscript is that in 2020, there was another Paper Mario game called uh, Paper Mario the Origami King, which I kind of have a love-hate relationship with, and a lot of people like it, but it's kind of just like, this is what the Paper Mario series is now. It's paper, literally paper <laughs> Mario. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's it's good. It's an enjoyable game. Um but it's. I don't think the series is ever going to go back to what it started out being. I don't think you can. It's like you know, if if you like fold a piece of paper, you can't ever get that crease ah, out, no matter yeah, how many. Yeah. Yep. Mm, true. No matter how many books ha- or heavy things you place on it, it's always going to have that little crease in it. You've you've ruined it. It's true. Okay, and then finally, I've got one more section to go through. <laughs> this is this should be shorter because uh it doesn't have such a long and like rocky history as Paper Mario. It's the Mario and Luigi series. This one has a lot more consistency. Um so the Mario and Luigi series was a completely portable series uh of RPGs that um was made by a, by a studio called Alpha Dream who isn't really known for doing much else besides this series. Uh and unfortunately 
they went bankrupt in October of 2019, which is funny because uh, I think when you originally contacted me about doing this episode, they still existed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're saying this, <laughs> they would still be around today had we actually done the episode in a time yeah we we could have just sparked so much interest in the mario and luigi series by talking about it back then we could have just like completely pulled them out of the red and and saved them so oh no i I hope you feel good didn't realize i had that much power oh no if we could only spread the vast force of the donkey kong fandom into the mario rpg fandom like just think of what we could have done but yeah, basically the Mario and Luigi series is probably just dead forever because the studio that made it is dead. So that's that's sad. Um, I guess I should talk about its life, though. Um, so the first game was Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga on the Game Boy Advance in 2003. This is one of my favorite games ever. Um, and so the thing about the Mario and Luigi series is it's it's like... It's pretty different from Paper Mario. Um, It's more focused on, like, action. Um, Like, you control both Mario and Luigi with different buttons, and then, like, in some of the later games, you're even controlling other characters. Like, uh, the sequel, Partners in Time, has you controlling four characters at once, basically. Um, And so so there's a lot of, like, attack dodging and, like, special moves that you have to do where you have to time things right. Um, So it's more action-focused than Paper Mario, and it also... Is, is like really advertised on its humor. It's like these games are so zany, but they are, but they actually have some like really dark content in them as well. Like some of the more creepy things in the Mario series, like the second game is about this alien invasion and these aliens that just come and like sap the life out of toads and the world around them. And uh, so some kind of weird stuff in there. Um, and the composer for this entire series was Yoko Shimomura, who, you know, went straight from SMRPG to doing this entire series of games. And so there was a nice through line there. Um, but yeah, this this uh, series was a lot more consistent than Paper Mario. Basically, Partners in Time came out in 2005. Bowser's Inside Story came out in 2009, which is sort of the fan favorite. Um, a lot of people consider this to be the peak of the series, and it kind of goes downhill after that. Um, so the next game was Dream Team on the 3DS in 2013, and uh, this one got a lot of criticism when it came out because it's like very tutorial happy. It's very handholdy. Um, people thought the pacing was bad. There's a lot of padding and stuff. So I think it's a fine game. I think people are a little too hard on it, but it's definitely like not great. It's not like a masterpiece or anything, but I like it well enough. And then uh, Paper Jam, which was actually a crossover between the Mario and Luigi and the Paper Mario series at the worst possible time it could have happened because at this time they were already crossing over with like the sticker star version of Paper Mario. So it's just like a series crossover that no one was actually excited for at this point. And also this Um, is kind of like the point of no return as far as like fully establishing that Paper Mario is canonically not Mario. He's some weird alternate. Yeah, like you were saying... um, Yeah, so I actually, this is the only Mario RPG I haven't played, but from what I understand in the context of the story, like, Paper Mario and his whole universe come out of this magical book. So yes, it does firmly establish that it's like a different reality. It's a different dimension. And then that begs the question if the Mario and Luigi, Mario and Luigi, are even the same Mario and Luigi, or if they're a weird alternate dimension version of Mario and Luigi, and then what is the real version of the character? Like, is it just the mainline Mario and Luigi? Like, ah, oh, it's... Yeah. It's obnoxious. That's what <laughs> it Mario is. The Mario multiverse. Yeah. Okay, so... And then the, the postscript to this... um is that so so at the time of Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battles release uh, basically the the um Mario and Luigi fandom was also somewhat sad and disillusioned just because not because like their series had changed drastically but it was just kind of considered to have gradually gone downhill in quality um and also be somewhat victim to this curse that Nintendo wouldn't let them have true fun with it anymore and all the toads had to be regular toads and all the Koopas had to be regular Koopas and and so on. Um, And then they made remakes of the first game and the third game for the 3DS. Um, And 
the first game remake, Superstar Saga, plus Bowser's Minions, that came out in October of 2017, and it did, like, all right. Um, and then in January of 2019, the remake of Bowser's Inside Story uh, sold, like, absolute shit because it was the end of the 3DS's life, basically, and uh, they were remaking a game that was, like, just, like, 10 years old and could still be played. Like, the cartridge, if you had it, could still be played on a 3DS. Um, it was already a dual-screen game, so, like, the improvements to it were very, like, minimal. It was, like, a lateral move at best, so... A lot of people thought it was, like, a completely pointless remake and nobody bought it, but I did! Because I wanted to support them, and it didn't matter because they went bankrupt. If only I had bought, like, a hundred thousand more copies, I could have just doubled the sales of it. Yeah, it's your but, fault. You know, I know. I've always yeah, said. Yeah, it's my fault, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so Feel that's bad. that! Okay, so that's your history lesson. Thank I hope you. hope you enjoyed it. That does you're help, welcome. because I honestly cannot... I, I Like, I, I could tell you some of those titles or I could vaguely pull them up in my head like yeah I, I know they crossed over with Paper Mario and I know there's the one where they time travel and there's the baby Mario and baby Luigi uh, and uh, I, I know people hate sticker star but like or, or whatever like but yeah I, I couldn't tell you the actual chronology and the actual timeline of of the whole series so that's much appreciated especially as we discuss Kingdom Battle and how that relates to the drama or dramas of the Mario RPG fandom. Mm -hmm. So, um, let, let, let me really quick address where I stand on Mario. Because believe it or not, I don't hate Mario. There is this misconception that I hate and despise everything the Mario series stands for. Uh, I'm, I'm this anti-Mario Donkey Kong zealot. And half of that is played up for comedic effect. You know, the truth is Mario was my go-to series in the early 1990s. Because I'm an old man. It's, it's just that when Donkey Kong Country came out. Uh, it was everything I had ever wanted from a video game and a video game series. It was perfectly tailored to all of my sensibilities. And the longer that things went, the more I found Mario and his world to be dull. Right? Like, especially as things became more standardized. I found Mario's world to be extremely boring. I like to compare it to Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. To me, that, that, and Donald Duck and the whole extended, like, Disney Duck universe, like Scrooge and, and, you know, everything else. Because Mickey Mouse has always been this bland corporate mascot. Ho oh, ho, you know. While the Duck franchise, you know, has been allowed to grow and have lore and, and all of these interesting bits for you to sink your teeth into, despite the two, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, having this shared lineage. And that's Mario and Donkey Kong to me. To a T. Like, I've always wanted more from Mario than just being the hoo-hoo, yippee kind of guy. Like, I, I want there to be some actual Mario meat for me to sink my teeth into yeah. rather than just be this fondant, this sugary facsimile of, of depth. You know, uh, even if it will never match Donkey Kong in my heart, I, I, f I feel kind of let down with the direction Mario went. And that's not to say like games like Odyssey aren't great, but I just feel like Mario, and by an extension, his world, is just, has kind of become soulless. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't mean I hate it. It doesn't mean I, I hate Mario. I, I like a lot about Mario, and I want to like a lot about Mario. But I've just felt let down with the direction it went. It just, it just isn't synced up with what I like about video games. Yeah, I mean... 
I get that feeling, although, like I said, for me, I think it took a lot longer because, you know, I, I was playing the Mario RPG games and uh, I was a huge fan of them for... And I still am, like, I'm still playing the Paper Mario games that come out because I guess they're going to just keep making them even though they're different now. And, like, I still enjoy them and all, but uh -huh. it's definitely, like, the appeal I found in the early games is not really there anymore for the most part. Like, so so what the early Mario RPGs did was like, take this really weird, surreal world that Mario lives in and, and make it feel like a living place. You have, you know, towns full of Goombas and towns full of Koopas that are your friends, and you can just talk to them, and they've each got names, and they say funny things, and, you know, you make, like, you have partners that come with you on your journey that have stories, and you have toads that, you know, you got, like, little kid toads, and you got, like, old man toads, and, and you know, it's just this world, and how how do people live and breathe in this, like, crazy world with warp pipes and mushrooms that make you grow big and stuff like that? Do, do they you just remember, live like normal people. Do you remember when they weren't just all called toads, when they were, like, mushroom people, and, and toad just referred to a guy named Toad? Yeah, although I think it's been a really long time since that was the case, but, I mean, like, back in, you know... Paper Mario and stuff, they, they did have names. Like, there's, right. you know, there, there's a lot of them have names that are puns and that, like, um, they, their last initial is T, so it'll be a pun where, like, there's, like, Tace T is, like, the, the chef, um, for instance. I don't know what kind of first name Tace is, but there you go. Um, <laughs> but at least it's but, a but then, name. Like, yeah, and like TTYD, there's just like a toad lady. Her name is Jolene. That's just a name. It's like not even a pun. That's just her name. <laughs> right. He's just got a regular old, regular human name. I love, I love that. You know, that, that's, yeah, that's great. the kind of thing. Like, I, I go back to Mario Party. That's, that's my weird go to example for this because they had all of those mushroom people in Mushroom Village. Uh, they were, they were just like, they had names, they were people, they had jobs and occupations and unique designs, and I felt like, hey, this is a real place, this is a real little village in Mario's world, this is awesome. Uh, yeah. I, I like the slice of life. I like, I like seeing and thinking about how this bland corporate mascot actually lives, you know, what does he do when he's not stomping on the turdies uh what does he do and he's yeah. not you know sliding down those flagpoles right and i think that's the biggest thing like dust and i just spent four hours discussing donkey kong's home life and i feel like that is something i did as a wee little kid watching the Super Mario Brothers Super Show and then playing the games. And I, I thought about Mario and Luigi as real people. And mm -hmm. I, as time went on, I got less and less of that. And it just became... Yeah. And not only... Yeah, not only do they, the old Mario RPGs give insight into Mario and Luigi and, like, the mushroom world, but also, like, Bowser and what it's like to be a minion working at Bowser's castle a little bit. You know, like mm -hmm. there, there were like these Bowser segments that were really fun. Um, they, they've always, the Mario RPG series has always given a lot of love to Bowser because he's such a potentially fun character. He can be intimidating, but also like really comedic at the same time. So, yeah. um, but you know, I don't want to rehash Mario fandom drama, Mario RPG fandom drama. Cause like I said, like I, I am still giving the new games a chance and everything, but like, as a just sort of example of the difference of where things stand now, like there is a major character in the Origami King, which came out in 2020, who is a professor who's a toad and his name is Professor Toad. And I love him. He is he is like one of my favorite characters in the game, but he does not get a name like Jolene or anything <laughs> like that. His name is Professor Toad and that's all he is. Right. That's all he's allowed to be. He's like a little Indiana Jones type guy, but he's also like kind of cowardly in a charming way. But um, but yeah, he's Professor Toad. And granted, just... Professor Toad almost like I cracked up when I heard it because that's almost the level of like the the go to rare joke of let's just have a really shitty name for a character and yeah. then that makes it funnier. <laughs> like you know, Mister Pants. Um, Captain Bones. It just like it just totally lazy and and effortless 
and then that makes it just more charming. Professor Toad isn't quite up to that caliber because then it just makes you think about the other Toad and then the other Toad. Um, I guess is is Captain Toad canonically a separate Toad than Toad? I don't even uh, know. I think so. <laughs> we don't even know because <laughs> I I uh, I have him in Mario Kart Tour. I I've unlocked Captain Toad, and I'm like, but are you? But who are you? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my favorite character in the Origami King is a uh, not Captain Toad. His name is Captain T Ode. That's as creative as they are allowed to get. <laughs> Captain T Ode. Yes, like, T dot O D E. But he's not Captain Toad. He's not Captain Toad because Captain T Ode is from the past. He's like he was frozen, but he's like thousands of years old, basically. Like frozen caveman lawyer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So, as someone who wasn't really paying attention back when Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle was announced, I it, it was E three twenty seventeen, and I I was out there in Los Angeles. That was the year where it was just me and Cameron at the uh, the party house, and I I remember when the game was announced. And a lot of people were talking about, I think we were in line to get into the Microsoft event when they, Ubisoft did their thing. I might be mixing this up, but I remember people were just like, oh, oh, they're doing this. Grant Kirkup's doing the music for it. And I was just like, Mario Rabbids? Oh, okay. (laughs) I wasn't really paying attention. All right. I should have been, but I wasn't. Uh, This was a full year before it became DKU. So was there any controversy that they were doing this Rabbids crossover rather than, say, Rayman himself, uh, you know, of which the Rabbids were spun off of the from the Rayman franchise. W- uh, like, where people were like, oh, Rabbids, ew. Was, was there any of that stigma involved? Uh, so, I've never really been into Rayman. I've played one Rayman game, and um, I actually did play Raving Rabbids on the Wii. Uh, that's not... I've played... Another Rayman game besides that. But, uh, so I like half played Raving Rabbids because, um, my parents got it for, like, me and my brother, but my brother was mostly the one who played it, and I, like, kind of played it a little bit. And I have, like, very vague memories of it, and they're honestly, like, looking back at it, it seems like the half formed memories I do have are, like, kind of like a creepypasta or something, because I just mm-hmm. remember, like, Rayman being trapped in, like, a prison by the rabbits, and he's just, like, really depressed, and you can just, like, walk around his prison room as Rayman, and he just, like, looks really sad. Um, and then you play all these mini games and stuff. But, like, that was my entire experience with the rabbits before this game came out, and I honestly hated it. Like, I thought that I did not enjoy the game at all. I thought the rabbits were these, like, scary little freaks who were, like, disgusting and crude and screamed a lot, and I did not like them. Um, so when I heard about this game... And I heard about it originally from, like, leaks, basically, before it was officially announced. Um, I was like, this sounds like it's probably going to be terrible, but because I'm such a big Mario spinoff fan and because Grant Kirkhope is doing the music, like, I just got to play this shit show and I got to just take one for the (laughs) team and I'm just going to, like, stream it and I'm just going to put it out there for everyone who doesn't want to buy it themselves to enjoy um, so, and this is all from just, like, the leaks and stuff, and definitely people were, like, also reacting similarly, like, what is this? This is just such an insane idea, like, who was asking for this? This is gonna be bad, but, but, um, when it was revealed at E3 officially, I was, like, won over instantly, just because, like, when they actually showed the game, it just looked so fun and appealing, and then you had that famous moment of Davide, like, crying because Miyamoto was there, and, like, it was just so obvious the team was so passionate about it. And, and like, hearing their little interviews and the gameplay previews at E3, like, they had clearly put so much thought and love into every detail. And I was, like, I just instantly went from, like, oh, this is going to be so bad, it's good, to, like, this is going to be so good, it's good. Yeah, I, I think I remember the leaks or, like, the rumors about this game existing. And I remember some of the hostility swarming around it then and then almost like instantly all the the reactions to it flipped and it was just uniformly positive and people were like 
I don't I don't know like people were try like getting in touch with me via phone like while I was in line to get into the Xbox thing and it, it was just like why aren't you excited about this and like what I thought we were supposed to hate this what what's going on like because I think there's this conception that the rabbits are similar to the minions and they're just mm-hmm. like annoying but like and, and like I don't know only like middle america would find them endearing i i I don't know but like (laughs) there there's a lot of these i think conceptions or misconceptions going into it and then just the strength of that reveal at at the ubisoft event with davide soliani and you know miyamoto and the genuine emotion and everybody was just instantly charmed by that and then that just changed everybody's way of looking at this project and of course i was in my own little bubble and i was just like what like i it's cool that grant is doing something for nintendo again it's cool that he's doing a mario game i'm happy for him but what uh so you know i it took me it took me a while to get it and honestly i didn't get it until i played it but um yeah, I, th- this is, I guess this is not exactly an RPG, as, as you alluded to. Um, like, an RPG has these different requirements to be an RPG, while this is some RPG DNA in it, but it's more of a just an RPG in a sense that it's turn-based and you're leveling up characters, but it's not technically a role-playing game. Mm-hmm. Um but it it's i guess because it has a lot of similar mechanics and it has a lot of that original personality that you would find in the early super mario rpg slash paper mario slash mario and luigi games it kind of feels like it it's it's part of that lineage mhm and i've been trying to beat this drum for years though telling all of these you know, disillusioned Mario RPG fans that I know. It's like, hey, if you are disappointed with the Mario and Luigi series being dead and Paper Mario being very different than what it used to be, and you haven't played Mario plus Rabbids yet because you're like, oh, Rabbids, really? Then it's like, you just put that aside and give it a chance because you really might love it because this game has, like, so much of what I found appealing in those early games. It's just got this, like, off-the-wall creativity where you never know what's going to happen next. It's got like some clever writing it's it's just having fun with the mario universe and it's like nintendo just kind of let them do whatever because it has the pretense that this isn't your dad's mushroom kingdom this is the mushroom kingdom invaded by the rabbits so it's like crazy so they can just have a little more fun with it and just do what they want to and nintendo's just like yeah whatever so it's it's just really refreshing it's got this good energy it definitely felt like the restraints were off it it um and that's something i immediately noticed and then noticed even more the further i progressed is well i'm actually laughing i'm i'm mm-hmm. i'm actually laughing with a mario game like it's actually making me laugh out loud at some of the jokes that they got away with in a way that I don't feel like I ever really have with with a Mario game. Maybe if I had played, you know, some of the early uh, Paper Mario games or whatever, sure. But I, I didn't. So, um, <laughs> but I, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to being, like, charmed by a Mario game. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it was a new experience for me, and I liked it. Yeah, so... Let's see. So I kind of went into this a little bit earlier, um, but, you know, it it shares some of the, the similar qualities with the other Mario RPGs. And one of those ways is that the characters kind of play a little bit of, of similar roles as they've, you know, showed up in the past. So Mario, um, usually in these games, is like the character that you always got to have because he's the, the hero. So in like SMRPG, you can swap out your party, but there's like a, a line that I quote all the time because it's like explaining to you that you have to have Mario in your party. But the way it says that is Mario must always fight. So <laughs> I don't know that 
that phrase is just stuck in my head for like years. Mario must always fight. And that's that's the case with Kingdom Battle as well. You've always got to have Mario. I'm, um, I'm just picturing Mario in this like old timey boxing poster, like shirtless and just holding up his fist. It just says Mario must always fight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but that's actually not the case in the sequel, it looks like, which is interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But another, like, gag that was very common in the Mario RPGs was, like, everyone knows and loves Mario, but, like, people don't know who Luigi is for some reason, and he just always gets, like, dunked on. And there's a little bit of that in this game, because, like, Beepo doesn't know Luigi's name. He calls him, like, Lewis or something at first. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. But it actually is kind of cute because rabid Luigi looks up to Luigi so much. And so it's it's nice that Luigi gets at least a little respect from somebody. Yeah. Yeah. The the the, the roles that all the characters played were really perfect in this game. And, and you mentioned, like, rabid Luigi. And, and I liked how rabid Luigi was, almost reminded me of, like, the bluster bluth of the gang. He was just so, <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I, I don't, Luigi. I, yeah, he's my precious son. I love him. Oh, uh, like yeah, <laughs> I, I like he's he's just like the runt of the litter, and uh, yeah, he's a little weirdo with his long sleeves and you know just running around what? sucking people with this vampire ability. <laughs> yes, why? Why is he a vampire? <laughs> but I appreciated that. Like that that was some something that could have gone wrong. Right, was making the rabid versions of the Mario cast just like like the Mario characters, but zanier, and mm-hmm. and they like they're different enough that they feel like wholly unique characters that maybe have some uh, attributes of their human counterparts, but just maybe like the more negative attributes amplified and like taken over the top to where they feel like they stand on their own. Yeah. So, so that's actually an interesting point. And I don't know if you want to talk about this now or we could come back to it later, but like the game never like really makes clear what exactly like the deal is with the rabbits each being like a counterpart to a Mario character. So like, how do you read that? Do you read it as them just like trying to emulate them or like, having a little bit of that personality injected into them? And do you see it as being sort of like their their most like wild impulses, if so? Or like, what's your read on, on yeah, the thing? Yeah, I, I, I think, and it's, it's hard to say, because we'll get into the story here in just a moment. But, you know, based on how they are created, I, I guess. Um, like, I, I don't think we can say view rabid peach as like an indictment against the real peach like i'm I'm not saying like the real peach would be that shallow and vainglorious um but but maybe there's just like uh, like 10 percent of her in there is actually like that and and mm-hmm. when combined with the rabbits id or i guess lack of it like lack of self-control then then you've got like yeah they're just like they're not bad necessarily, but they they are like completely. If you are like this newly generated human being without years of experience or social niceties ingrained into you, you are going to probably be obnoxious. You are probably going to be somebody everybody wants to avoid. And I feel like that's what the rabid versions of these characters are. Is what if Peach? never like what if she would just form instantaneously without any of the like royal schooling she's had to go through or whatever (laughs) yeah and and what if luigi didn't have all of these adventures what if he was just like his his neuroses and anxieties and Mm -hmm. you know just pasted over this hyperactive uh rabbit creature uh you know i that's the way i take it but i guess it's up to interpretation yeah, I think that's pretty much how I view it too. Weirdly, like, the, you know, the, the rabid character, the rabid protagonist that is most like their counterpart is Rabid Cranky, which we will discuss next time. Oh yeah. I, I like that based on what we discussed, and it's like, you know, the rabbits are if if they didn't have their like socializing and adventures and whatever, what they would turn into. But so you're basically implying that cranky would be cranky no matter what. Like <laughs> right. 
Cranky will always return to being cranky. Or maybe Cranky's just too old to care about those niceties anymore. And True. so he's, he's basically... We'll, we'll all become cranky one yeah. day. <laughs> um, that, that is like what I like about that. And then the that allows the game to focus on humor, which, which is kind of unusual for me with a Mario game is, you know... Like, the Mario RPGs all had humor to different degrees. But this this is, I think, the first time where I fully experienced this. And I really felt like, hey, this feels like a rare game. This feels <laughs> like the humor you would see in a rare game. Yeah, humor doesn't necessarily translate all the time internationally. And this feels like, the, in some ways... If it's not the dry British sensibilities that Rare would sometimes inject, it's some of their naughtier impulses sneaking through. And yeah. and that's what I really got here. But what I appreciate is that Mario is the straight man to all of this madness that's unfolding. And Mario isn't, like, bended or or, like, flanderized to be something he's not. He's not a more interesting character in this. For better or for worse, he's still the boring straight man. He's the company mascot. But the game makes that work by having these agents of chaos thrown into this world. I think it inherently makes Mario himself and his world more funny. Because yeah, you get, like, you get to instance, watch how he reacts to everything and, and the mortified way he tries to deal with it. <laughs> Yeah, like there's this, uh, this happens like I think during or right before, uh, the like second boss battle against the icicle golem. Uh Um, but like there's this shot of just like Mario looking on and he just has this extremely concerned look on his face. And like when that happened in the game in my replay that I just did, it just like hit me like a ton of bricks because I've seen that used as a reaction image like all over Twitter for like years now. It's just because he's so like expressive in this moment. It's just Mario looking like really sad and concerned and people like use it on like Nintendo DMCA'd some music off of YouTube or whatever. So they just like put a sad Mario there. <laughs> and like, it's just, we were talking about humor. Um, one thing I think that is a great strength of this game is that a lot of its humor is, like, just purely visual. It's in the expressions yeah. and the animations and, like, whatever the silly little rabbits are doing off to the side. Um, so so a lot of it is going to translate into, like, any language because it's just visual humor. And obviously Beepo is going to make his little sassy comments on whatever. But the bulk of it isn't just, like, you know, universal body language type stuff. Yeah, I... For me, like my my go to example is actually at the end of the first boss battle, first world's boss battle uh, against Rabbit Kong, where like I guess minor spoilers here if you haven't played it, but Rabbit Kong is kind of hanging on perilously to this uh, like teetering uh, like platform of blocks that he's on. And Rabbit Peach, like, goes to poke the the block that will, like, make it come tumbling down like a Jenga tower. And Mario's just like, no, don't do it. Like, this this isn't what we do. Like, we don't commit murder. And and <laughs> Rabbit Peach is just like, oh, but I've got to. <laughs> and she just pokes it. And then she takes yep. her selfies and Mario's just, like, horrified at what he's gotten himself into. Like, what what has befallen his world? This isn't what Mario does. This isn't what he's about, but he has no choice. He is but uh, a passenger in this uh, train of insanity. Yeah, that whole part is just, like, just just good stuff happening constantly. There's, like, a, a lot of funny things just happening back to back in that cutscene. I won't spoil it, but it's great. <laughs> And, you know, the the world building for this is constructed because, you know, you think a, a turn-based game that's, you know, tactical, you know, grid, everything's on a grid, right? So, like, you're like, well, what, what can you really do with world building and immersion there? But, you know, it's constructed so that there are these navigable routes, like you... They're, they're like these small like walkways between the battles, and that's really where the bulk of I think the the lore at, comes from. 
because they're all filled, as you mentioned, with humorous background details, all like visual jokes of the rabbits invading the Mushroom Kingdom and how the elements from the dimension they came from, or I guess the dimension of the inventor and Beepo, we'll, we'll get into that, but ha- have like folded into it. Like in, in the ancient gardens, you've got the bathroom uh, becoming part of like Flushy Forest, I guess. And you just get all of these like elements from the apartment now, like, imprinted on the mushroom kingdom in this very like weird way but you can also stop and there are these interactable parts where beepo will then explain to you like what's happening and not only will you get some lore but you also get some genuinely funny dialogue Mm -hmm. and it's almost mischievous what they're able to get away with in a mario game albeit one that's rated i guess e10 plus you know it's it's there, there's some elbow room there for them to work a little bit more blue than you're used to in a Mario game. But I couldn't believe it's some of the jokes they got away with. Oh yeah. There's like one enemy type that is very common throughout the latter half of the game that I just cannot believe exists and I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. it's pretty great. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a game that constantly surprised me, I guess. And for a Mario game to surprise me to the extent that this did, in, in just, like, making me laugh and shocking me, uh, I'm still kind of bewildered this exists and that it hasn't been, like, recalled and they're making a sequel. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did they get away with that? And how are they still getting away with it? I, I don't know, but... It's it's amazing. Um, but yeah, it all works because they don't change Mario. They don't really change the Mushroom Kingdom. They make it work because all of the humor stems from these contrasting elements from the Rabbit series coming in and upending the kind of buttoned up stagnant world that I, I've been complaining about since the beginning of this episode. And I love that. I, it, it, it's the yeah. perfect way to do it. It's honestly not what I would have done. I was just like, no, let's make Mario funny. Let's make his world funny. And it's like, no, that wouldn't really be true to where the series is trended. But we can make it funny. We just have to really play up that contrast. Well, let's talk about the story a little bit. Because mm-hmm. I see the story of this game interpreted like so many different ways. Depending on, I guess, what the goalpost of the interpretee is. Because, okay, so the story involves this... I, I, is, is she unnamed? Does she never get a name? Yeah, I believe in the credits she's just called Scientist Girl or Genius, genius girl, girl or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, Genius Girl probably sounds good. Yeah, that, that's what, that's what I, I took away from it. So I, think, I think it might be Genius Girl, but... This unnamed inventor who is a big fan of the Super Mario series. And she has a robot butler slash assistant slash sidekick to name Beepo. It looks like a Roomba. Yeah, basically a Roomba. Yeah. And um, she's created something called the Super Merge, mm-hmm. which, which is itself a merged compound word. But it's not Super Merge, it's Super Merge. Like uh, like a, like an accent, like supa. Um, but okay. She, so so this this supa merge can almost magically combine two items to create a new item. Um, just mm-hmm. makes it a, a hybridization of of the two, and um, and then for some unexplained reason, the rabbits show up in their time traveling washing machine. Which, having never played a rabbit game. And only played part of a Rayman game in my life. I assume this is a well-established convention of the Yeah, I know. It's established for sure. Some people in my stream were telling me it was from at least one other game. So this game didn't make it up. But but they show up in their time-traveling washing machine. And they start creating a ruckus in in her room. Uh, they, They use the super merge to create rabid hybrids 
of the Mario cast because of all the Mario paraphernalia around the room, right? That That's what happens. Yeah. Uh, She's basically got little, like, amiibo-type figurines. Yeah, so so a rabbit combines with that and then forms this, like, funhouse mirror version of, you know, Mario and Luigi and Peach and Yoshi. And then the, the Mario poster up on her wall gets lodged on the time machine. That malfunctions... And opens up a portal into the Mushroom Kingdom. Mm-hmm. So that's the story. A little bit more avant-garde than, than you would see in some modern-day Mario games. But I see so many fans trying to argue that this game isn't canon. Uh, much like the people who try to tell me that Super Smash Brothers isn't canon. And that we should just ignore it because it's not the real characters. And a Super Smash Brothers, at least you can make that argument at least early on. You know, it's like, oh, they're 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 toys or they're they're trophies. Um, I think Ultimate really gets away from that, and it's like, no, they're the real characters accepted. Yeah, but, I mean, Ultimate, you've got them like actually getting the letters that are the invitations <laughs> and stuff. So it seems to suggest that it's like supposed to really be them. You I th- know? I think Smash is such a runaway success at this point that they're not even trying to have that in there. It's like, uh, oh, but don't worry, Mario isn't mm-hmm. actually slapping Link. Uh, this is all it's all <laughs> make believe. It's like, no, no, Smash is the king yeah. now. Like Mario yeah. is smacking Link, and we love it. <laughs> right, uh, but like. This, I, I'm not sure how so many people get this interpretation, because this is the interpretation that I have, but I, I want to talk to you, and, and we'll mm-hmm. hash it out. So, uh, people are, are try to argue that this isn't the Mushroom Kingdom, that this is just a reality created based on the Genius Girl's stuff, but that's not what's happening, right? They're opening a portal to the Mushroom Kingdom based on the Genius Girl's stuff. The genius girl is either from the rabbit's dimension or from something close to our own, where Mario is a video game series, similar to Earth Prime in DC Comics, where DC Comics are just comic books and people read them, but it exists in DC Comics multiverse, so characters from (laughs) DC Comics can go... Anyway, um, so... It's canonically the same Mushroom Kingdom, the same Mario, the same Peach, the same Luigi, same Yoshi, Toad, Bowser, Bowser Jr., etc. There's just this element of multiversal meta-ness mm-hmm. injecting it. Right? Right? Yeah, I mean, that's how I interpret it, too, because in my opinion, that's the most fun and rewarding way <laughs> to interpret it. Instead of, I mean, I can, I can definitely see, like, if someone was like, Well, no, clearly it just merged with the poster and made a whole Mushroom Kingdom. And I mean, if someone really wanted to argue that, I would have a hard time, like, actually refuting it if that's what they want to believe. But, like, it could go either way. And I think it's just a lot more fun to believe it. Yeah, they just went, like, the Mushroom Kingdom exists in some other dimension and they just went there because the poster could open, like, a portal to it. And this is the real deal. Um, Right. Like, like, it's... We just talked about on the Killer Instinct episode that Cameron and I did about how even in the context of the rare shared universe, the Donkey Kong universe, you know, they know they're video game characters and they are video game characters because video games based on them have been made by a studio Mm -hmm. named Rare. And so you've got different tiers of meta-ness in in the DKU itself, where they break the fourth wall, but there's also a built-in in-universe reason for them breaking the fourth wall because there are video games based on them. So exactly. It, they, so this isn't anything new. No, it's not disqualifying to say, well, you know, th- this genius girl is a fan of Mario, and to her, they're just video games. So they they, she, they there can't possibly be a real Mushroom Kingdom. It's like, no, there can be, you know, especially in a multiverse where anything is possible. I mean, the multiverse mm-hmm. is huge right now. You know, the MCU, there, there's that, that other movie, um, whatever it's called, every everything at once, everywhere, whatever it's called. But Everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's just in the culture right now. Maybe 2017 predated it being so ubiquitous as it is now, but... 
I think now it's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's just it's just the multiverse. That's what happens. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I guess like people might think it's weird because this game ends with the rabbits just kind of. It's not like they leave or anything. Like this game just kind of implies that rabbits just live in the mushroom kingdom now. They're just kind of there along with Koopas and Goombas and whatever. But hey, I like that. Oh, well, and, and Donkey <laughs> I mean, Kong Adventure. We're not going to see them. Donkey Kong uh-huh. Ad- Adventure picks up with that notion that yeah, they're still there. And Sparks of Hope implies that, yeah, they're still there, you know, so... Yeah. 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 So we're maybe probably not going to see them in any game outside of this series, but I don't think there's anything wrong with imagining that, you know, maybe most of them go back and travel around the universe or whatever they do, but some of them just kind of live in the Mushroom Kingdom now, and that's just, you know, adding to its many, many species that already live there. Well, a few of them did appear as spirits in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, so... Yeah. You know, they, they, they've gotten around outside of this series, but yeah. I, and I think a lot of people have trouble with this interpretation if it's the real Mushroom Kingdom because Donkey Kong Adventure establishes that Donkey Kong Island is in a separate dimension. And mm-hmm, yeah, I love that. I know. I love it too. But there are people out there who don't like that. Uh, and they're like, no, DK, DK Vine can't be right about this. <laughs> of all the things, they can't be right about this. And so they look for other explanations and, and we'll get into that <laughs> next time. But yeah, I have a vested interest in saying, no, this is canon, damn it. This is everything I've ever wanted. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the original characters a bit, shall we? And I want to mm-hmm. start with the character that, outside of anything in Donkey Kong Adventure, means the most to DK Vine and the conversation. Of course, Rabid Kong. Mm -hmm. So Rabid Kong, he was a big part of the early promotional push of this game, right? I mean, hell, he even appears... I said Donkey Kong doesn't appear on the Gold Edition game case, but there's Rabid Kong in the background uh, behind all of the, the main characters uh sans yoshi uh and rabid yoshi but rabid kong was a a huge part of the i guess rollout for this game and when it was unveiled at e3 2017 there was a big rabid kong statue in the south hall lobby of the los angeles convention center i did several humorous poses in front of it to express my put upon dismay because you know th- th- this was a year e3 2017 i know they all start to blend together until their e3 doesn't exist anymore but e3 2017 was a year where we didn't really have any donkey kong stuff announced so it was the classic dk vine style of being you know oh woe was us we're so put upon oh the poor beleaguered donkey kong fan we have no donkey kong content but we have this bastardization of donkey kong in the form of rabid kong oh oh won't somebody think of the poor donkey kong fan but you know (laughs) that aside in the context of the game I think Rabbit Kong works. And especially once we get into DK Adventure and mm-hmm. contrast him to the real Donkey Kong. Because again, like, Rabbit Peach isn't an indictment against regular Peach. Rabbit Luigi isn't just like a, a full on parody of regular Luigi. It, it's basically taking their impulses and magnifying them. And so that's what Rabbit Kong is. He's a more bestial sort of idiot kind of kind of character um and and so you know if if you didn't have that contrast with the other rabid protagonist and you didn't have dk adventure you know maybe i might question it but i enjoy him as a more buffoonish take on donkey kong Mm -hmm. especially when you consider that he was created via a rabid and i guess donkey kong merchandise from the mario series that genius girl had i don't know (laughs) yeah um she probably has like a dk figurine too in there somewhere. well yeah so in in ancient gardens you've got those dk barrels those giant dk barrels floating in the Mm -hmm. river of a was sunset bridge 
And and so I like that it represents that, yeah, Genius Girl does have some Donkey Kong merchandise in her house as well. Maybe put out under the Mario branding. Uh, but yeah, she's got it. And uh, that's why there are these just, just a light touch of Donkey Kong elements in the main adventure. Uh, so I, I enjoy that parallel to our real world. And it's it's a nice, fun way of having that uh homage to donkey kong very early in the game actually if if you're just playing because you've got to play through the first world to unlock donkey kong adventure you've downloaded it um so if you're just there for the donkey kong content you can just play that first world and then jump into donkey kong adventure you know um and and you've got all the donkey kong content but yeah. I would rec- and I want to point out it's it's not just like arbitrary like oh you just got to play the first world before we'll let you play the DLC. It's because the DLC's story is a direct follow on from yeah. things that happened up to that point. So yeah. I, you, know, I, you got to set it up. I would recommend sticking with the main adventure though, and I say this as the Donkey Kong guy, just because you know it, it's worth your time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Beepo. I didn't expect to like Beepo as much as I did. Um, Be- I love Beepo. Beepo I, I named my Twitch chatbot after Beepo. Beepo is a snarky little shit, isn't he? Yes. Uh, so he's really sassy and he also swears. It's always, you know, the like cartoon, it just becomes a bunch of symbols type yeah. swearing, but he's, he's, he's cussing. The, the con- it's pretty kind, great. kind of like the Conqueror's Bad Fur Day style. Uh, censored expletives, but in, in mm-hmm. Beepo's own style. Yeah, Beepo, Beepo is a surprising breakout star of this game. And and you're just like, wh- wh- why do you have to have this robot chaperone? But it works. And especially adding that l- the little touch of lore that isn't needed. Like, you don't have to stop and examine everything. But Beepo's not just there as a tutorial guy he's not just there as your professor chops uh he's also there to add colorful insight to what's happening if you really want it and as somebody who does want it i appreciate it and i stop every time and i take screenshots and i'm just like i want to document this for later document it for later i want to go back and look at all of this Mm -hmm. yeah Um, yeah there's like a you know that's another common thing with mario rpgs is there's often like a sidekick character who fills this role of sort of like being your guide and like explaining things and whatever. And uh, they can be better and worse. Um, sometimes they're kind of forgettable. Often they, they have this sassy streak. Uh, it's, that's a very common thing. But I think Beepo is still a standout among them just because like just just the surprising like anger that he can have all of a sudden. And also like, I don't know, he's he's got some particularly funny commentary and just comes off as like, a li- like I-, I feel like the game recognizes that he's like a little bit of a jerk and, and they're not afraid to lean into that he can be kind of a narcissistic robot um especially with some things that happen at the end which i definitely won't spoil because it's really good um but and i just think it's always interesting how he i don't think he knew what rabbits were before they invaded his house where he lived with the scientist girl yeah and now he just pretends to like be an expert on them because whenever you pass a rabbit doing a weird thing he's always just like oh rabbits will be like that you know like he's just what do you know about rabbits people well, shut up he did he did get those uh rabbit ears uh at, that's at the true start. so maybe he's he's got that innate knowledge now right it, it was just grafted onto him but yeah that, that's interesting because yeah i said that maybe genius girl and beepo were from the same dimension as the rabbits but i guess maybe the rabbits just hop dimensions into their dimension which is supposed to be similar to our own dimension except maybe a little bit more technologically advanced because they have something that can just merge items i don't know but you know it, I don't think it really matters unless you're like a hyper obsessive Rayman fan and you're like, wait, is, is this genius girl part of the Rayman series? And you know, <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's just me projecting onto other series fans. Uh, I like to imagine there's a DK vine for every series out there and they're just as weird as I am, but yeah, Be- Beepo is great. Uh, Beepo is, is honestly probably one of my favorite Mario characters now. Uh, full stop. Like I, I, I would follow Beepo for sure. Um, we already talked about the rabid companions. You know, Rabbit Mario, Peach, 
Luigi and Yoshi. Is there anything you would like to add to what we haven't brought up or or to what we already um, brought up that we haven't said? I think we'll probably end up talking more about Rabid Peach in the Donkey Kong Adventure episode yeah. because she really gets a lot of time to shine there. Um, I liked her in the base game. I used her in a lot of battles. Um, probably most battles I had her, uh, but I came to like really, really like her in Donkey Kong Adventure. Um, and I guess the, the main ones that I used both the first time I played this game and in my replay are Rabid Peach and Rabid Luigi. Oh, same, um, same. Yeah. They, yeah. They were, like, I, I love the vamp dash ability. It's great. Even when I like unlocked the other characters, I, I still like th- those were the ones who were mostly in my party just because I mm-hmm. love the dynamic of them both. And, and like Rabid Peach, you know, I think she's probably the breakout character of this. I said Beepo, but, you know, that's just my personal taste. But I think Rabbit Peach is, is by and large, you know, the, the character who I think resonated the most, especially since, you know, absolutely they put her in Donkey Kong Adventure because of that, because she was such a fun character to write for. And um, so, yeah, but... Um, yeah, she she's it's just fun to have like a character like this in a Mario game. She's always taking selfies and just like she feels like a very un Mario like character. It, it feels weird to have this in Mario's world. This this kind of a, a more modern trope, right? Than than mm-hmm. the stuff Mario plays with, which mostly you know is characters created in the mid 1980s and harken back to even earlier than that the things that i like about rabid peach are like you know on a very surface level and like when she was first introduced um it it can seem like the game is maybe painting some things about her negatively like oh she's kind of vain and she's Mm. always stopping to take selfies and whatever it's like uh look at this like you know just completely narcissistic person but when you think about it like well, first of all, you find out that, like, her selfies at the end, they sort of become, like, the credits reel. So it's like, oh, she's been documenting the adventure the whole time. So there was, like, a right. good point to her doing that. But also, like, when you think about it, she's, like, this insane little gremlin because she's a rabid. And, like, it's not like she's the most, like, conventionally, conventionally attractive person like Peach actually is. Like, she is just this... She's a rabbit, so she's just this weird little creature. But she, like, completely owns who she is. And she's, like, so proud of herself. And she, like is, you know, got that perfect confidence. And I think that's, like, really cool, actually. Like, I don't know. I just I just love her her self-confidence and her style and everything. And she's just so happy with who she is. And I think it's neat. Yeah. It, I was going to compare her to, like, a Kardashian. But, you know, I, I think that would make the Kardashians likable for me as if they were transformed <laughs> into insane little gremlins, as you, as you put it. Um, I was like, oh, okay. I can get on board with that. Um then there are the rabid enemies, you know, the the Ziggies and I like how we didn't even talk about Rabid Mario and Rabid Yoshi. But I mean, I tr- I don't know. I just like barely use them yeah, both in my same. first playthrough in this one. Like the later you get a character in this game, just like the harder it is to work them into your party, I think, because you get used to the ones that you have and some of the characters are introduced like so late. It's just like, well, I only get to choose two every time because you have to have mario so like i mean i could stick with the people that i know or i i could try yoshi in this battle i could try rabid yoshi in this battle but it's like i don't know i just kind of don't feel like doing that i mean people people were like oh you should definitely use rabid yoshi more often or something but i'm like eh, i don't know. he's cute i like him but like i don't i just never really feel like it yeah and i i like the again the dynamic of rabid peach and rabid L- luigi especially contrast to mario himself like Mm -hmm. it's a bit different to have like a a mirror image of mario with mario uh i like the diversity that uh rabid peach and rabid luigi bring just like these these bizarre uh, i don't know like nightmare versions of his brother and his uh his special lady friend um but yeah the uh the rabid enemies. Uh, I, you know, I, not knowing anything about rabbits prior to this, are are these like original archetypes for 
the rabbits made for this game, or like do Ziggy's appear in, uh, in? No, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're all original. Okay. In fact, in the rest of the rabbit series, I think that there have been a few rabbits who have like different body types, but for the vast majority of them, it's just the same little little rabbits. Mm -hmm. So the fact that this game gets so heavily into like big beefy rabbits and stuff is pretty interesting. <laughs> right. Uh I love how much personality all of the uh, the enemy types have. I mean, it, it does remind me a little bit of the Donkey Kong series and, like, you know, the, the Kremlins or, you know, more recently the Snowmans. I say more recently as if it wasn't eight years ago. But, you know, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but it, it does remind me of, you know, you get a lot of uh, personality shining through uh, limited presentation. They're, they're all yeah, well-designed and, and animated and... That also informs what they do in the battles, and so mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of education there. You're you're kind of thrust into it when a new rabbit appears, and you kind of figure it out from there. Yeah, and it's really neat how like the same archetypes can be found throughout the game, but their appearance changes based on the different area that you're in. Oh yeah, and uh, like the Smashers are probably my favorite for that because. Whatever they're carrying on their back can be pretty fun, and it just like changes by the area. Yeah, yeah. For uh, for the DKU absolutists in the audience, that's similar to what Platonic does with the corplets in ukulele. Mm -hmm. so I'm trying to keep it relatable for, I guess, me uh, and and nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting that this game speaks so much to me being a rare slash DKU fan and I guess you uh, as well but also you're not just a rare and DKU fan you are a Mario RPG fan and mm -hmm. um I, I guess is, is that the the depth and world building without losing the sense of humor yeah so like I said you know two hours ago now or whatever um <laughs> welcome when, to the conversation I, like, yeah yeah uh when i first played paper mario back in middle school i was already like a big fan of donkey kong and banjo kazooie and what i found in the mario rpgs was a lot of the similar elements that endeared me to rares games which is like if you were just to look at these games without playing them you'd be like oh this is just like some goofy cartoony thing like everything is just bright and colorful and mm -hmm. silly but then if you actually play it, you see that there's, like, this surprising amount of care given to the characters and, like, the world and the history and the way things all tie together. I'm not saying it's, like, the, like, deepest story ever told in a game, but it is, like, you you can tell that the creators did think about things and they you know, put some care into the world that they were crafting and consistency within the characters uh, that they were creating. And, um... There's not a lot of cont continuity between, like, the Paper Mario series. It's always kind of introducing a new cast, whatever. The Mario and Luigi series actually did have some continuity, though. Um, like, you know, there's there's this one villain in the first Mario and Luigi game. He's, like, the henchman of the main villain. And then um, in the sequel, he's there, but he's kind of, like, lying low, scheming. And then in the third game, he comes back as the main villain. Um, so he's got this whole arc where he, like, you know... His his mentor essentially gets killed right in front of his face, and then he's like, well, you know, I can do this on my own, actually. I never needed her. And then it, it's kind of like if Klungo went on to become the big bad in Nuts and Bolts or something instead of actually becoming a good guy instead. Yeah. Um, but so you got that similar kind of, like, character arcs, even though these are just kind of, like, mostly humorous games, you know? Yeah. Like, like with K. Rule having a character arc throughout the DKC series where he just gets, like more and more unhinged to the point where he's had enough of just kidnapping people and he's going to try to blow up the whole island now, you know? And that, that's what I gravitate to in games in general is I like lore, I like pathos even, but I also don't want a game to take itself so seriously. Like, the whole triple A, just, like, we're, we're going to be so far up our own ass that we're not going to have a good time with it. Like, <laughs> I, I, mm -hmm. I like that balance of comedic silliness and and maybe you know colorful cartoony worlds that are escaped from the dreary doldrums of our reality but you know mm -hmm. uh, you're not afraid to have character growth there as well and and see an evolution 
happen in the universe of, you know, a character's actions here might later influence this over here. Uh, and I appreciate that. And I and we get that with this game, especially going into the DLC uh, with, mm-hmm. with characters like Rabbit Kong. Uh, and yeah, I like taking it as, as a whole, as a whole package, it, yeah, it, it did feel like some of the stuff that Rare would do with their characters, you know, going from one game to another. Um, you mentioned Klungo and K. Roll, and that's what I was thinking of, um, as well. Yeah, and I think we're going to get even more of that going into Sparks of Hope. Like, um, for instance, Rabid Luigi is no longer this weird little vampire <laughs> child as much. He's rolled up his sleeves. He's got some overalls now. Looks like he's maybe growing up a little bit, which, you know, kind of makes me a little sad almost. But I'm looking forward to seeing how they play that. And, you know, with him having had more time around Mario and Luigi, he's he's sort of been able to mature a little bit, I guess. So that's interesting. Yeah, so... And, and maybe this is something we'll speak more to next time when we talk about Donkey Kong Adventure. But Sparks of Hope is kind of this big question mark for us right now at DK Vine is, well, will Sparks of Hope be DKU? Will, will any characters appear in it? Like, uh, I don't think Donkey Kong will appear in it. I don't. I, I, think, um, I think Donkey Kong Adventure was was it really and and it allowed them to play with donkey kong but i don't think we're gonna see a similar like donkey kong adventure dlc for for sparks it'll be something else you know yeah yeah i agree and and we'll we'll speak more to that when we we talk in the the full-on donkey kong follow-up to this but yeah i i i am looking forward to sparks of hope just to see how those characters evolve like it, it would be interesting because we mentioned like the rabid versions of the characters and how they came to be. And, and it's like, well, what happens when they have a year or two to like live a- and evolve as little people? Will, will they still be as impulsive and weird or will they start resembling their mainstream counterparts more? They're learning to talk. Yeah. That is weird. <laughs> they have voice clips now. Yeah. They can say words. <laughs> Which, which kind of freaking me out. Which unfortunately might destroy the charm of these characters, or it might make them more interesting. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how they. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a tightrope to walk because so much of what makes them work is that just, you know, anarchy that they represent. But yeah, you know, I, I think this this team has has shown that they have the chops to handle such delicate maneuvers, and I'm looking forward to it. Speaking of the team. Mm-hmm. We have to talk about Grant Kirkhope because yes, Grant, we do. Grant Kirkhope is the the link, you know, here between uh, vintage, rare, and this game. Um, and, and, you know, Grant often gets pigeonholed or, or typecast with with his musical stylings because I think most people probably associate him with two games or or franchises, Banjo Kazooie and Donkey Kong sixty four, and he's done other things. He's did other things for Rare, but I th- I think those are the two most identifiable Kirkhope soundtracks. What what you think of when you think Grant Kirkhope? You're you're going to hear mm-hmm. the Spiral Mountain theme or the the DK Isles medley or, or, or whatever, and because Donkey Kong 64, you know, many of the tracks were more in a Banjo-Kazooie style. Some of them were composed for Banjo-Kazooie or Banjo-Kazooie in mind. Then a more established Donkey Kong style. So the the Kirkhopian sound is kind of defined. Just like I think the David Wise sound is defined for a lot of people as being this kind of new agey synth-based, a dream, dreamy kind of uh, soundscape. And, you know, Robin Beanland, for example, isn't really pigeonholed or typecast because he hasn't really allowed himself to be defined by one sound. He's just, he just, mm-hmm. he just keeps moving that ball. But both Wise and Kirkhope are capable of doing so much more. It just, their most successful work kind of eclipses everything else. So, anyway, 
to have Grant Kirkhope enter the Mario series in 2017 for the very first time. It was like, what is this going to be like? Like, I can't imagine Grant Kirkhope doing Mario music. And, you know, when I, when I finally sat down with it, when I finally heard it, it reminded me of David Wise doing Tropical Freeze to a, to a lesser extent, uh, because David Wise doing Tropical Freeze is just David Wise returning to Donkey Kong, but he's doing it with, you know, so much more capability, you know, the, the Wii U being, you know, having a much larger, a, a, a bigger ability to convey sound than the Super Nintendo did, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have more, more full orchestration and it's it just a lot more lush and David Wise was, br- was able to bring a lot more to Tropical Freeze. And I think it's the same thing here with Grant Kirko, but it's Grant Kirko doing a completely different game series. And it's fantastic. Like other than a few distinctive, I was going to say whiffs, but that's, that's, you know, smelling, uh, whatever ear whiffs are. Uh, other than a few, like, little things here, I would have never guessed this was Grant Kirkhope if I didn't already know it was Grant Kirkhope. See, maybe it's just because I know that for sure, but I feel like I, I definitely would recognize it as him. Um, even, like, I don't know, there were just, like, certain parts in different songs where like an, an underlying melody or just the way he uses chords or well, instrumentation or something where I'd be like, oh, this sounds like Fungi Forest at night. This sounds like, you know, this this certain other song that he did or whatever. Well, that's what I meant by ear whiffs. Like you do get, yeah. you do get that. But like if, if I was in the dark, if I didn't know, I'd be like, that kind of reminds me of Grant Kirk. Though, yeah, but that's no. fair. Like you couldn't say it for like certain. Yeah. Like there's a lot of... um. I feel like he was really firing all, on all cylinders for this. He was super excited to be working with Nintendo on a Mario game, and it definitely shows with the effort he put into it. There's a lot of, like, melodic complexity going on, just so many, like, melodies and counter-melodies, and it's just, like, this is some of his most complex music, I think, and it's it's really, really good. I listen to this soundtrack, like, all the time, um, and it was, like, to the point where... I've heard some of this music so much, it was kind of weird to play it again and, like, actually hear it in its context again. How surreal was it that, you know, we got David Wise in 2014, we got Grant Kirkhope in 2017, and again 2018, and then again in 2019, because this set the stage for him doing music for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate with Banjo-Kazooie. So, mm-hmm. like, but how, how surreal is it that we got both of them? composing DKU games without Rare for Nintendo. Like, that that's just unthinkable. That would have been unthinkable, uh, you know, even, even like five years beforehand. You know, it, it just mm-hmm. would have never dawned on me that this would have been a possibility. And it's just, I, I'm, I was so happy for him. But then I like actually heard it and I was just like, wow. Like, he really brought it. <laughs> this- yeah, and it's not like it was just a coincidence either, because I believe that the reason Davide chose him is because he was just a, such a big fan of, like, Rare's N64 in in games, and was like, when I make this Mario game, that's who I want to have. Yeah. And so they just made it happen. You yeah. Know? Yeah, it's, it's great. It's great that that can just happen, that we live in a world where it's just like, yeah, get me Grant Kirkhope, and then it just falls into place. I will say... Uh, that, you know, Rabid Kong's battle music is a new, more dastardly arrangement of the Jungle Japes song from Donkey Kong 64. And that mm-hmm. is still bewildering to me uh, all of these years later. I can't believe that Grant was allowed to come in and sort of give his own Donkey Kong music a boost in a Mario game in 2017. Because, you know, Donkey Kong music, it, it's mostly Wise's stuff um, be, that, that gets remixed or, or brought back to the forefront. You get the DK rap 
out, out of what what Grant brought, but you don't <laughs> really hear a lot of the songs in Donkey Kong 64 other than the DK rap. Um, and so to get that kind of credibility boost, to put it back up on a pedestal and say, no, this is just as much Donkey Kong music as David's stuff. I love that. I love that it was able to do that. Because, yeah. yeah, it's... I there, there is a lot I love about the Donkey Kong 64 soundtrack. And I wish... Like, and Evelyn's stuff, too. I wish they would, you know, do more with it um, and get more remixes for it. So, e- even if it's just Grant coming in and saying, I'll do it myself, a la Thanos, it's great. Uh, I love it. And it you know that that's also something i loved about donkey kong adventure is oh my god grant kirkup is doing all new donkey kong music <laughs> like this is... <laughs> but yeah. yeah i mean like even then like jungle japes is like a take on dk island swing but yeah clearly the rabbit con music is more of a take on jungle japes than like the original dk island swing so it's kind of like you know a stair step thing there but then in dk adventure he does get to like actually revisit his own completely original sure. compositions yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, But yeah, it, so I mean, is... It, it, is, it is like clearly the Jungle Japes yeah. interpretation of it. At, exactly. At, so. Specifically, it sounds the most like probably like the rainy area where Cranky is yeah. in that level. The, the the rainy area with Rambi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> where you get to play as Rambi for 30 seconds. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> right. Don't, yeah, I, I could go in a rant and we would be here another two hours, so we're not going to do that. A, a uh, rant be. <laughs> so we have, I was going to say calls. It, it's the same caller, but they exceeded the limit. So then they called back and they <laughs> finished their thoughts. So we are going to take uh, this call and then we're going to take the second call immediately after to let them finish. But that's why it's broken up the way it is. And then we will start giving... It's not even our final thoughts because we have a whole DLC campaign with Donkey Kong that we need to get to next time. So we are just going to, as we used to say, put a pin in it for now. Hey, DK Vine. This is Traveler of the Stars here. Long-time listener. I think only second, third-time caller. It's been a while since I've called. I'm excited that... uh, you guys are finally doing the Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle episode because, wow, what a spinoff. I remember when this was being, like, rumored to High Heaven and Ubisoft had leaked it, and, boy, did this game sound stupid. I mean, just talking from a Mario and Sonic fan's perspective, I was a little missed that, the, you know, the first Mario RPG crossover was with the Rabbids, and to be honest... I still am. Um, and the Mario and Sonic games are fine, but uh, I'm still waiting for a true Mario and Sonic crossover. Anyway, um, and, you know, the, the Rabbids are kind of like the Minions before the Minions. Not as bad, but they definitely are kind of eh. Um, but I, when the game came out, or I guess being shown off, it just had a lot of clearly love and passion put into it. I remember on the E3 show floor, Ubisoft's uh, press conference, when uh, Dave Soliani, I think that's his name, uh, like when Miyamoto's on stage and he had called him out and he was tearing up. And that's kind of when I realized, oh, wait, this, this, this game has something different about it. It wasn't just like a soulless cash grab. And just with all, and as the game was being shown off, just all the animations being shown for, the level of polish, uh, of course, the Grant Kirk Coat music, which I'm sure you've talked about already. It just was clear that a lot of love was being put into the game, and it wasn't some, uh, it wasn't like a Minions movie, but with Mario, you know? Um, and the game came out, and wow, I mean, one of the best Mario spinoffs in years. I mean, I feel like lately a lot of people have been bemoaning Nintendo for, you know, the recent Mario sports games. But I, and you know they talk about the best Switch games. You know you got Mario Odyssey, Breath of the Wild, Luigi Mansion Three, Kirby, and the Forgotten Land, so on and so forth. And I feel like this game kind of gets forgotten about. And um, you know I can kind of see that. Obviously, the strategy RPGs aren't for everyone, and you know some people are just never going to like the Rabbids, which I understand. But man, what a very interesting, very cool game. Um, I will say towards the end, it does get, there is kind of a difficulty spike, 
I'd say around the haunted area. I forget the name of it. Um, and yeah, but other than that, it's usually pretty fair. Um, I like the dynamic between Bowser Jr. and Spawny. Uh, my favorite music track in there is probably Mid Boss Mayhem. I think Grant Kirkhope said that was his favorite as well. Uh, I think I'm coming low on the time, so I'll probably have to call back one second. Hey, DK Vine, sorry, I'll make this brief. Uh, don't want to take up too much time. Uh, anyway, as I was saying, uh, the Grant Kirkhope music, yeah, all really good, of course. It's really cool to see his take on Peach's Castle, and you can tell he really loves uh, doing the music for this game, especially when he got to do the music for the DK Adventure DLC, which I know we're not talking about today, but that's also really good. Um, yeah, I really hope that the sequel will be just as good, if not better. It's looking like it's going to be. I'm excited to hear more Grant Kirkhope music. Um, and yeah, what a, again, what a weird series to become a series, you know? Um, but yeah, if, if these games continue on, I'll probably keep buying them. Um, I hope that, you know, for DK Vine's sake, that the next DLC, I think they already did confirm there's, there's going to be like a DLC adventure for Sparks of Hope. I hope they'll, uh, you know, maybe do a, a DK, um, DLC, maybe. <laughs> Since it's in space, they'll bring back Xanonab, you know, and, and uh, Plantain and have more of an interstellar Donkey Kong game finally. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I guess I do wonder if you are planning on getting Sparks of Hope, if there are no Donkey Kong references in it. I know in your Twitter post you said uh, Kingdom Battle is one of your favorites. And Mars been off recent memory, but I wasn't sure what you were planning on doing about the sequel. But, uh... Yeah, anyways, uh, sorry for rambling on. I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts on the game. See you later. Well, thank you for the calls, Traveler of the Stars. And they asked, will I travel in the stars with Sparks of Hope? And, you know, I think I will. I, 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 this game won me over. Um, it was a long, hard battle it fought with me, but I... <laughs> But now you have some hope that you'll enjoy the sequel. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I like, Davide Soliani and his team, they made a Mario game that I unabashedly loved. And yes, it had to be DKU to get me in the door. But now that I'm in the door, yeah, I'll pick up Sparks of Hope. Um, and I know, Courtney, you'll do the same. Um, Oh, day one. Yeah. I'm there. I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> You're less of a freak than I am, but that's, you know, I, I, I'm going to get it too. Maybe not day one, but I will definitely pick it up and hopefully will not uh, struggle with what packaging I need <laughs> first and foremost. Because I don't think they're going to do a Donkey Kong Adventure for it. I think it was kind of a time and place to do the Donkey Kong Adventure, especially because it came out right when Donkey Kong was shifting gears behind the scenes and they needed like a placeholder to keep Donkey Kong kind of going while they changed what the next game was going to be and who was making it and all of that drama that we've detailed here on the conversation. So I, I don't think this will be Donkey Kong centric, at least a DLC. That doesn't mean the Donkey Kong... I gotta- I was muted, uh, you know, for, to let the call play, but, like, at the thought that the DLC of Sparks of Hope would be about Xanonab, I just, like, I started laughing. Yeah, so I don't I don't think... I would, I mean, that would be amazing, but it would be just amazing. the idea. I, I, I give uh, Ubisoft and Milan a lot of credit. I don't think they have the pool to bring Xanonab back, <laughs> but <laughs> if they did, like, that would be, that would be fantastic. Like, yeah, but Xanonab. <laughs> bring Xanonab, let's bring in uh, that that cybernetic unicorn Kong from Barrel Blatt. Like, let's get in all the space elements if there was a Donkey Kong adventure, sure. Um, <laughs> but thank you for the call, Traveler of the Stars. I hope this episode was worth the wait. It Probably nothing could be worth the wait, but I hope it at least like filled up the meter maybe like 30% of the way for you. Um, and maybe the next episode we'll we'll get it up closer. Uh, in the live stream, the aforementioned Jeff Onan brought up a great point that I hadn't really considered until he brought it up. And of course, he was the one who brought it up. He compared Rabid Peach 
to the the Lady Gremlin from Gremlins 2, The New Batch, which is a fantastic movie, by the way. One of the best sequels ever made. Um, and the more that I think about it, that's really what all of the rabbits in this game are, at least the protagonist rabbits. They are essentially the gremlins from Gremlins to the new batch. And, and like we've been comparing them to the minions, Traveler of the Stars compared them to the minions, but really they are the gremlins from off of Gremlins 2. And that's why they work so well, because they bring that same level of chaos to Mario's world. So mm -hmm. I, I said like rare, I felt like a lot of rare DNA in here, but I think there's a lot of Joe Dante DNA in here as well. So good call, Jeff. Thank you for contributing. And Cameron says, get rare on the horn to sign off on rabid whiz pig. Well, whiz pig is back in the news. I, I, I guess mm -hmm. we should bring this up because I don't think Cameron and I are going to do a conversation mini on this. But Fangamer, uh, this last week, just revealed more Rare Racers merchandise, including a Conquer pin, Conquer in a plane, and a Whizpig pin. Whizpig on his uh, missile, his, his crotch rocket. And uh, yeah, Whizpig merchandise in the year 2022. It's happening. I've already ordered mine. Uh, <laughs> I, and I've ordered an extra one to give away as a Twitter giveaway on DK Vine's Twitter account. So stay tuned for that. Jeff says, Heil, I love you. Jeff, I love you too. In fact, I love everyone listening. My heart is swelling with love right now. And I love you, Davide Soliani, for making what might be my favorite Mario game in years. No, 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 no. It is. It is my favorite Mario game in years. You know, despite the difficulty I had getting into the gameplay, just just the turn-based thing that I've always struggled with in any RPG I picked up, any tactical game I picked up, uh, despite it being you know on a grid, I don't I don't like grids, Courtney. I don't like math. I don't like. <laughs> geometry i i i just uh like i i shudder when we're playing sea of thieves and they bring up like the just like the development the like the like they're, they're just making me see the matrix code behind the game and i'm not allowed to actually enjoy the immersion of oh i'm a pirate on the seas no no this was this is all just fake you're you're living a falsehood i don't like that in my games and i don't like thinking about that but the writing the humor the charm the music the presentation it is all terrific um and it even like what i was worried about with rabid kong i was like oh this is just going to be disrespectful to Donkey Kong, but it even respects Donkey Kong's own adjacent and sometimes intermingled role with Mario. It, it, it keeps it at an arm's length. It acknowledges it, it exists, but it doesn't disrespect it at all. It, it even managed to overcome my problems with Mario himself. Mario the corporate mascot. Mario the Mickey Mouse. And I didn't do it by fixing him or his character or his world, but just injecting Gremlins 2, the new batch style chaos into it and watching him react with increasingly horrified expressions. <laughs> I love it. Um, and so if it was David, Davide Soliani's dream to work on a Mario game, if it was Grant Kirkhope's dream to work on a Mario game, they not only rose to the occasion, but they surpassed so many of the Mario titles that came before them, in my opinion. What, what are your final thoughts, Corny? Because I, I could ramble on and on, but I you are the guest. I want to hear what you have to say. I don't want to steamroll you. 
Oh, thank you. Well, I just, <laughs> when you were talking about Rabbit Kong, I just, uh, neither of us brought up that, like, in the battle when he makes all the bananas appear in front of him, it's like the banana collecting yes. sound effect from DKC. Oh, yes, That's yes. That's so good. It is, it is. <laughs> I love how they're able to reference all these little bits, because there, there are, arc- I guess there are arcade references in Donkey Kong Adventure, but they reference, you know, Donkey Kong Country and Donkey Kong 64, not just in the music, but later on in Donkey Kong Adventure, you get, like, more visual references to Donkey Kong 64, but I love how it kind of reminds me of Skylanders, how Skylanders just went out of its way to reference, like, all the different little eras of Donkey Kong in its presentation, and it just felt like this this total embrace of the history, rather than just focusing on one little aspect of it. Yeah, um... So I guess my final thoughts are, this is, uh, yeah, this is like maybe my favorite game that's exclusive to the Switch. I just have really, really loved it since the first time I played it, and I uh, am always telling people to play it because it goes on sale a lot. You can get this game for really cheap a lot of the time, and the amount of content in this game is immense. Like, uh, you know, the DLC, we'll talk about it next week, of course, but... um, just in case people don't listen to us talk about this for three more hours or whatever. Um, like, I really can't undersell how meaty it is for DLC. It's like basically Mario plus Rabbids 1.5. It's not just like, oh, a little thing you can get through in a couple hours. It's like almost a sequel in itself. It's shorter than the main game, of course, but it is really just the amount of effort put into it is immense. Um, and then if you enjoy getting through the main game or the DLC, there's like a bunch of optional challenges you can do. Oh. So like, yeah. We, in, in this... Can, can uh-huh, we talk really on. quick about the optional challenges? Because mm-hmm. did you get hung up on so many of them like I did where I, I stubbornly refused to move on until I beat those extra challenges and then... Yeah, so what's interesting is the first time I played this game, I I did, like, you know, once I beat a chapter, I would go back and do all or most of the challenges. Yeah. Um, and through doing that, you earn more coins and you earn even more skill tree orbs to level yourself up. Um, and, you know, when I did my replay over the past couple weeks, I didn't have time for that. I just, I, like, had to hustle and I ended up beating the game just in time as it was. So I found the ending of the game to be a lot more difficult than I remember it being because I wasn't able to, like, level myself up as much or, like, afford the best weapons for every single character. So you are, like, rewarded for, you know, you may see it as getting hung up on things, but there's, like, a definite reward for going back and doing a lot of that optional content. I know, but... Um, And the reward is making the end of the game (laughs) not as hard. But some of it, some of those challenges are easier if you come back later on when you are, you have skilled up, and it, but it's, it's just, like... I'm doing my Banjo Kazooie slow run with DK Vine done slow on Twitch right now, and like, I didn't even bother like, even even uh, trying to beat Mister Vile before I got the running shoes because I'm like, uh, whatever. But I remember back in the day, yeah. like, I was adamant that no, I have to beat Mister Vile now. I have to do this in order if I can. Right. And like, it's always possible the first time through, but it will be easier if you yeah. come back later. But then you get the trade off, right? Because like, maybe you want those extra skill orbs now so you can, you know, have an easier time in the main game. And we've it's already like, established. Gotta make that decision. We've already established how my brain can be hung up on something relatively insignificant, but it can just completely <laughs> derail me for years. <laughs> oh, Donkey Konga 2 says hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh yeah, this game is is just I think it's awesome. It's packed with stuff to see, stuff to read. Like the weapon descriptions are often like they often get overlooked as a source of humor, but they're very good, like just the design and the descriptions of the weapons. Um and just there's just so much in this game. Um it's an amazing package and I am glad that it seems to be getting like kind of a renewed interest with uh nintendo put it for like demo recently anyone who had the nintendo online service could play this game for free for like a week or so Mm -hmm. um and with the sequel being announced with the release date and you know there's just kind of a general renewed interest in people trying to play the first game before the sequel comes out and that makes me really happy because it's a great game and more people should play it i agree i agree and 
I hope that this puts to bed the misconception that I hate Mario. See, I don't hate Mario. In fact, I can love Mario if the right game comes along. So thank you. Good night. We'll see you next time. This has been a File 2 production. Perico. Oh, are we done recording? Oh, thank God that's over with. Oh, Mario, Mario, I can't wait to wash the foul taste of that mustachioed moron out of my mouth of the Donkey Kong Adventure episode next week. Hoo-hoo, yippee, pasta pizza pie. I wish he would just throw away his plunger, if I'm honest. Throw away his plunger and use his tongue to get the poop out of the toilets. Because that's what he is, you know. He's a poop eater. He's a stupid poop eater. I hate Mario. Wait, are we still recording?